Facebook Live audience. And now it is my pleasure to welcome our Director of Policy and Intergovernmental Affairs, Director of Mediation, Erlene Lahore. Thank you, Zulai. Good afternoon, everyone. It is an honor to welcome you to the PHRC School to Prison Pipeline Restorative Justice Committee, second annual two-day conference, Restoration, Redirecting the Path Towards Positive Educational Outcomes. It has been a very rewarding experience to work with such a dedicated group. Co-Chair Stacy Waters, committee members Vanessa Edwards, Ian Farnestock, Gregory Holtz, Gloria Richardson, Zulai Woaz, who served as our secretary, and Dr. Raquel Yangst. A special thank you to Laura Arjun White, our director of communications. We have a fantastic lineup of speakers. First, you will hear opening remarks from our illustrious executive director, Chad Dion Lasseter, a national expert in race relations. As executive director, he has developed and launched a no hate in our state town hall to address the surge of white naturalism in Pennsylvania and develop programs such as a global social justice initiative, black and Jewish beloved community dialogue, the college race dialogue initiative and a social justice lecture series. Mr. Lassiter received his master's degree from the University of Pennsylvania Graduate School of Social Work, where he was the A. Philip Randolph Award winner in 2001, and received his bachelor's degree in social work from Johnson C. Smith University in 1995. He is a co-founder of the University of Pennsylvania School of Social, work, Social Policy and Practice, Black Men at Penn, the first Ivy League Black male group of social workers. In 2019, he was inducted into that school alumni hall of fame. He is the 2021 recipient of the Pennsylvania Social Worker of the Year Award, which honors a member who exemplifies the best of the profession's values and achievements through specific <laughs> accomplishments. Yeah, that's my best. I give you Chad Dion Lassiter. Thank you so much, Gerlene. I just want to say good afternoon and greetings to everyone that's uh, here in the beloved community, both on our Zoom and on Facebook, uh, and all those that will be joining us. I'm really excited for what I will say right now is going to be two days of just some high level pragmatic and practical conversations around the school to prison pipeline. Uh, prior to coming on live, I was saying to the committee just how proud I am of each of them and how I'm already thinking about next year and this being in person, a full day conference in Harrisburg. Um, I wanna open up by just providing uh, some theoretical framework uh, that this work for me, uh, when we're talking about school to prison pipeline or what my colleague, the former Secretary of Correction, John Wetzel and I have said over the past 15 years, really is a community to school to prison pipeline. For me, this is not an intellectual exercise. Uh, I'm very excited about the lineup of speakers because for them, I, don't, I know that they would attest that it's not a intellectual exercise as well. For them, that we're not here romanticizing the conditions of those who experience the surveillance in their schools as it relates to the school to prison pipeline. Uh, I worked uh, intimately with uh, those who have been incarcerated uh, in state correctional institutes over the past 10 years, mentoring youth whose parents were incarcerated in state or federal prison. And so looking at the forms of educational apartheid in Pennsylvania throughout our country have been very, very important to me. The school to prison pipeline refers to the consistent stream of children, uh, disproportionately students of color, especially black boys that move from public schools into the prison system. Often this process starts with disciplinary actions due to subjective behavioral issues such as disrespect, which is influenced by negative stereotypes as black youth 
uh, being more adult than their peers and black boys in particular being seen as dangerous. White students were more likely to be disciplined for recordable offenses such as vandalism. As a result, black students represent 31% of school related arrests and are three times more likely to be suspended or expelled compared to their white peers. This process starts incredibly young. The data speaks to 50% of suspensions in preschool. I'm gonna say this again. 50% of suspensions in preschool are black children. Despite a report finding black students are misbehaving no more than, their, than other students are. Instead of offering these youth the support to succeed in school, such as additional tutoring or counseling services, or working to fix larger systemic and structural issues they may be facing in their lives, these youth are punished with zero tolerance policies that greatly increase the likelihood of them entering into a juvenile system or dropping out of school altogether. Schools where students of color made up more than half of the uh, student population were found to use more strict surveillance practices in addition to SROs, school resource officers, including security cameras, random sweeps, metal detectors, and locked gates. Two to 18 times greater than schools where students of color made up 20% of less of the student population, these things occur. The heavy-handed security measures have severe implications in the long-lasting educational and sociological harm they can cause on students of color. The state of constant surveillance has been noted to create an environment where these students understand and they also internalize that the school system sees them as, as a potential threat, as criminal, and less than. So it's important that over the next two days we come into this space with our full humanity listening to some of the present all the presentations that we're going to hear and once again i want to thank the committee because even in the the space of covid-19 and having this for the second year in a row you all did not let this come off of the social justice radar a personal thanks to girlene and stacy as, as the co-chairs to our director of communications and one of our commissioners who is going to be one of the presenters as well this is a two-day conference. We look forward to you promoting this conference with your myriad of uh, connections uh, throughout the rest of the conference. And once again, greetings and welcome. Have a great conference. Thank you, Edie Lassiter, for those words and those remarks. I would like to introduce our committee member Ms. Vanessa Edwards, who will present our next speaker. Vanessa. Good afternoon. Dr. Raquel Yanks directed the bilingual education program for the Reading School District for 35 years. She has been a member of the Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission since 1978 and presently serves as vice chairperson. In this capacity, she continues to address the educational needs of Latino and other mon minority students. Dr. Yanks holds a master's degree in guidance and counseling from Kutztown University and a doctorate degree in urban and bilingual education from Temple University. Please direct your attention to Dr. Raquel O. Yanks. Oh, she's muted. Hold on just a second for us. Hi, can everybody hear Raquel? No. Raquel, no, would cannot. you like to say something? No, we can't hear her. No. <clears throat> Uh, apparently, we can't hear you. Hold on one second. You want to give me a call, Raquel? Um, seven.
Yeah. Go ahead. Yes. We still can't hear. We heard her for a few minutes and then she was gone. Good afternoon, everybody. There is something going on. There's something going on. Okay. While we wait, while we wait, um, I would just uh, say a few verses from a wonderful poem on school to prison pipeline. You tried to bury us in your snowstorm war when your king was in need of assistance and we were just minding our business. Mm -hmm. But it became your mission to make us the villain to your hero in the narrative you pushed. Incarceration across the nation, if our pigmentation is out of favor. Fathers failing from the streets, fade in their baby's memories, all grace taken from our captured kings. And the child's next in line, you say with education will make it, but your stance says otherwise when you stand outside, ready to grab his hand and guide him down the pipe with 25 for life. But now your chains are unable to wash us away. So you've opened the gates, letting your bullets fall, heavy as rain on our heads. Death spreads, assassination across the nation because our pigmentation is out of favor. Are we back on? That looks beautiful. Thank you for sharing that, Erlene. And it looks like Dr. Yanks is still having technical difficulties. So at this time, at this time, we will uh, ask our executive director to continue with some remarks that he had prepared. Um, in the event we would have um, technical difficulties. As you know, our executive director is a man of vision and he's always ready for what's gonna come next. So executive director, please take the floor. So just briefly, I think one of the great things that is occurring across the landscape of not just Pennsylvania, but across the landscape of our democracy is that there are so many um, groups, so many social justice entities that are looking at uh, the school to prison pipeline, uh, looking at some of the policies that we see. Um, and I think for me, one of the things that oftentimes is missing in this discourse, uh, and we're really, really fortunate here at the PHRC uh, for uh, a person that I oftentimes rely on, I'm thankful for all the staff, but Renessa Edwards um, presently is uh, working on a degree in counseling. And one of the things that she and I and others will be working on as it relates to PHRC, how can we bring more of a counseling fill into the work that we do for civil rights, human rights, and human relations? And so what I mean by that is, let's just think about it in context. A lot of young people come into a community from a community to a school context with forms of trauma. And whatever we talk about, whenever we talk about a context, there's a pretext. And so you come to school, some teachers may see you as squirmy. Um, it may be because your parent or your guardian may not want you on Ritalin to deal with your ADD or ADHD, 
or you may just be naturally inquisitive. Uh, I remember when I was in school, I grew up in a household where a mother and father, and particularly a father in the service said, sit still. It was very hard to sit still in school when I was in corduroys. So corduroys had me <laughs> moving all the time because you know I, I just couldn't sit still in the classroom. The movement of black boys, this is a lot of the work that Howard Stevenson and I did with a grant from the National Institute of Mental Health called PLAY, uh, P-L-A-A-Y, which is an acronym for Preventing Long-Term Anger and Aggression in Youth, that rolling up a piece of paper and taking it to the trash can doesn't always become just a minor task. It becomes a form of exploration that the young male may have put it in the wastebasket and then may end up out of the classroom, down the hall, in another classroom, in a bathroom. And so we may see that as just being defiant, oppositional defiant disorder. But for that young person, it may just be something triggered them in an inquisitive manner. And so when we're talking about zero tolerance policies, are we looking at some of the trauma that young people are experiencing when they come into the school? Uh, do we look at factors of resiliency? Are we also looking at the way we treat young people? When you think about Tamir Rice um, in uh, Cleveland, Ohio, the police came upon uh, Tamir Rice and they looked at him as if he was 21 years old when he was only 12. So we mm. parentify these young people. We look at these young people as they are much older than what they really are. And these are our babies. Uh, that's why I always say I've never met a young person that is bad. I've met young people who are good and young people who have had challenges. And so if we look at young people and give them those protective factors, and what I mean by those protective factors, kind of understand that maybe the head was down throughout the classroom process because last night, not painting a picture of pathology, they were dealing with a form of trauma. The mere fact that you go to school Monday through Friday and then here it is a Saturday or Sunday, someone gets murdered and we don't dispatch community interventionists. We don't dispatch... Uh, uh, social workers. We don't dispatch people who can talk to the young person about what they're going through. What we do is that block that they have to go to that passes the school, it serves as a visual trauma, a vicarious traumatization because we have the teddy bear, we have the balloons, we have the, uh, the, the candles and things of that nature. And then on Monday, we go straight to a pedagogy. The first thing we should say on Monday is sixth graders, seventh graders, eighth graders, whatever the school modality is, come to the auditorium, we have trauma counselors that's going to ask you a question. Raheem, share with us in your own way how you felt about your friend being murdered. So there, we become desensitized and detached from what's happening in the community, and then it correlates over into school. And then when we're talking about the school to prison pipeline aspect, we defund education. We don't have true uh, conversations around educational apartheid for Black and brown young people with the funding school formula and white students. See, that's the thing that we miss, is that white racism disadvantages whites as well. And so you have these schools where young people are on a conveyor belt, almost like a white collar factory coming out with limited or no skills to compete in the global market economy. It's our job as advocates for justice to simply say, you know, we don't, and we're not painting all teachers the same. We want trusted adults, but there's something about living the experience, having more male teachers and having more teachers of color and competent, culturally competent teachers, whether they're white, Asian, American, Pacific Island, Latinx, that are in the classroom with the, with the teachers, I mean, with the young people. We also don't want to absolve the community from its responsibilities. So that's why my framing becomes community to school to prison pipeline. So when a parent not generalized on a stereotype, says, you know, my son doesn't know how to read. Mom, how often are you reading with your son? So education, the highest form of education is to know thyself, and it doesn't just start in the classroom. It should start at home, but we understand that parents have forms and guardians have forms of trauma as well. That's why we should be establishing something called COPE, Community Outreach Through Parent Empowerment. We should also be establishing something called Schools Without Borders. So whatever the school's not te teaching, that's okay. The community can teach that. The community can teach Carter G. Winston's miseducation of the Negro, Dr. Naeem Akbar breaking psychological chain slavery. The community can teach how to uh, be a citizen of the world, how to advocate for elderly rights and things of that nature. So we're not going to solve the school to prison pipeline with a two day conference. But one of the things that we can do is when we're looking at the theme of this restoration and, and, and restoring. And when I think about the word restoring, I'm talking about restoring 
uh, dignity back into the space where we are not looking at black and brown children as non-person, non-entity, further oppressing them and marginalizing them uh, for the purposes of feeding with Michelle Alexander. But what we've known even before Michelle Alexander's seminal work is the school to prison pipeline that feeds into the mass incarceration and the new Jim Crow. And so it does start with uh, the mere fact that we go into schools uh, right after coming from summer and a lot of schools uh, and the data is there for Philadelphia, is there for Trenton, is there for Newark, New Jersey, various other places, Camden comes to mind. You've been off all summer and then the first day of school in September, you're going through a metal detector. What are you saying psychologically to the, to the young person? I just, I was off all summer. The first day of school, I have to go through a metal detector and make no mistake, this is not sensationalizing it. There are schools where there are actually sniff dogs there are schools where you come through the metal detector and then there is also the wand that, you know, make sure that you don't have a weapon or anything on you. Uh, and we know that doesn't happen in a lot of other schools. So the overcriminalization still is part and partial. And I don't want to get ahead of the amazing presentation by my colleague, uh, Michael Court tomorrow that's going to look at this from the inception of slavery uh, to Jim Crow to where we are now with the surveillance, the slave codes, the, all those things that looks at some of the work of uh, the, the, the film 13th Amendment, some of the work of uh, multiple others in this space. Um, and so we have a, a real problem on our hand from a, a institutional standpoint. Um, and so, you know, once again, over the next two days, you'll hear from people who are in this space, uh, who have a, a command on this, this topic, um, who we're looking forward to listening. And ultimately after the two day conference, this should spark us into a call of action uh, to be very, very vocal, very, very active with regards to our school boards, with regards to our community. I'll end by simply saying, don't lose the concept of education or school without borders. Uh, it's a phenomenon that is an outgrowth of some of the work of the 1960s uh, with the Black Panthers. It's the outgrowth of some of the work that has happened uh, with freedom schools in the South, where you don't have to actually have a schoolhouse uh, to really bring about a pedagogy of education. We've seen it with our Jewish colleagues, whether it's been Jewish day schools and things of that nature, that no matter what the schools are saying, we're not gonna teach this, we're not gonna teach that. A school without borders is community-based and there are things that we can be teaching and we should be teaching in the community uh, that's against the aspect of forms of assimilation, uh, forms of indoctrination that oftentimes happens uh, with our forms of education uh, in, in America. And so that's just, you know, just some stuff. Um, also, lastly, want to simply say that um, thank you for those of you who are still on here. Uh, 76 people are on here. Uh, we do have technical difficulties. We as a commission, uh, probably if we're honest and earnest, have gone through uh, virtual fatigue because we've been on these for a considerable period of time, but hopefully we've uh, gotten some things uh, squared away and we can bring in our speaker or move to our next speaker, um, who is a dynamic, brilliant young man uh, by the name of Brandon Flood, who has the lived experience, uh, but also has the practical experience in multiple roles and stepped out on faith uh, to start his own LLC, uh, which is good. Um, we don't always have to be beholden to the, the entities that we work for, but there is something called social justice entrepreneurship where we can pursue some things uh, with our intellectual curiosity, our intellectual property, all on behalf of humanity. Um, are we ready to go to back to Dr. Yanks? Are we ready to go to um, our next speaker uh, so that we can bring the energy up uh, as it relates to this conference? Well, um, uh, Edie Lassiter, to be quite um, to be quite honest, uh, the energy has been up um, with your speech. Uh, the chat room is going off. Uh, it's going off uh, the energies of the chain. Uh, we have such comments as you are going right uh, in ED. Uh, this is real talk right here. Um, and, and this is what we, we are looking to um, inspire uh, the folks here uh, this afternoon. Uh, there are comments such as, yes, that violence becomes a norm for black and brown children. Um, so what you have definitely elicited some very positive and, uh, and important feedback. Could you please elaborate on um, 
the fact that violence has become a norm for black and brown children and how they have been taught to uh, accept um, crisis in our community and the and how it relates to the school to prison pipeline. Yeah, um, just for clarity purposes, I don't think it's necessarily become the norm. I think what happens is that a lot of these communities are under siege um, and there's a lot of structural variables. So for instance, when we turn on the nightly news, we hear about black on black violence, uh, but we never hear about white on white violence. We never hear about Asian uh, American Pacific Islanders on Asian American Pacific Islander violence. Um, you don't hear about um, Latin on Latin violence. People kill people that they live in close proximity to. So if you were to live in Detroit, Chicago, Philadelphia, and various other catchment areas, we would pretty much think that, you know, Black people are violent people that, you know, we hear terms like Black Lives Matter. I wish they just mattered to Black people. They do matter to Black people. Um, uh, the dominant, I don't like words like dominant, but the larger society, are, they're not in our non-traditional spaces which are you know, our barbershops, our beauty salons, our bowling alley, our pool halls, our taverns where we're having conversations. You know, The conversations are magnified simply because we're embarrassed because the people who are committing the crime, those are our nieces, our nephews, those are our family members. So this notion of like, well, if a white officer kills a, a black person, uh, they march, but when a black people kill black people, they don't march. We're talking state sanctioned violence. An uh, officer is, is given a badge, uh, given uh, policies and codes to follow, right? And so when we're looking at this aspect of, you know, normalizing violence, I think it's more of just a protective factor of, you know, just how we look, we don't look at uh, grief uh, the same way that some people look at it on the other side of the color line, right? So we look at some certain forms of grief as a sacrament for others, and then on, on a different side of the color line, we're looking at it like, you know, why are they complaining? So when you think about it, right, uh, I went to public schools in the city of Philadelphia. Uh, there were times where I was opinionated uh, and I raised my hand because I knew the knowledge because maybe my uncle just got out of jail and he was telling me about from Babylon to Timbuktu, which is a amazing book by Rudolph Windsor. And I was in ninth grade and I wanted to talk about, you know, Mali and I wanted to talk about Imhotep. And my geography teacher was white, and not because he was white. He was just like, there's no such place as um, uh, Timbuktu. And, you know, for me, I wasn't debating him, but in ninth grade, I'm just like, yo, what I heard was you're telling me my uncle doesn't know what he's talking about. And so th that was kind of like a, a front. And then when you find out that, yo, Timbuktu did exist, it was in Mali, and there were many great dynasties, and you confront the teacher intellectually, ninth grade, tenth grade, you're being told, like, yo, you're being you're being oppositional, go to the principal office. And you're like, go to the principal office and you get a pink slip. And so when, I, when I've worked in schools um, throughout Philadelphia and in Newark and Camden and Trenton, um, we're not saying all schools, but we've been so very quick to discipline along the lines of punitive measures as opposed to talking to young people, right? Now, we don't want young people being disrespectful to trusted adults. But for me, when I talk about not normalizing um, some of the violence. What I'm really talking about is how we gloss over it. I feel as though um, for all young people, we should do uh, a stop of a stoppage of work, right? I was in Columbine right after the shooting in Columbine providing trauma counseling. And those communities, nobody's talking about Shakespeare. Nobody's doing English. Nobody's talking about anything. They're talking about the trauma that happened at that particular time. And the community, right? So I'm not letting the community off. The community in Columbine and various other places, they also did not allow for individuals to just gloss over some of those situations. So we have a lot of things in, in that, that play into this, right? We have forms of uh, toxic masculinity. We have forms of not having um, individuals who can come in. And, and with all due respect to those who are educators, some educators are saying, hey, listen, I'm just an educator. I'm not trying to double as a counselor, as a therapist, um, but I think that's where identity comes in, where we have to teach multiple identities because as social workers, as counselors, a lot of us, we just want to be that and we're asked to be other things, mentors, advice givers and things of that nature. So once again, I think there's a lot of good things that are happening uh, in schools where there are no, uh, people are speaking back to the zero tolerance policies. People are looking at more effective ways of corrective action, not just discipline, but corrective action, sitting down, 
uh, talking to young people, uh, holding young people accountable. Uh, I go back to the work of Howard Stevenson. He talks about uh, getting with, sticking to, watching over. Watching over is just that conditional uh, love where we oftentimes say uh, the African proverb, it takes the village to raise a child. It actually takes a healthy village to raise a healthy child. Aspects of our village are not healthy. How do we make them healthy? And then the getting with means I'm just going to confront you. You know, and so a lot of young black males, we confront them with a lot of the work that we've done where a white teacher may tell you to take off your hat, pull up your pants and you don't listen. But then when a black male, don't play that gender game. When a trusted adult tells you to do something, we need you to do something. So that's that getting getting with. And then that ultimate thing of, you know, getting with, watching over, sticking to, sticking to the aspect of affirming who they are and creating spaces for them to imagine a world differently. And what I mean by that is in school, there are multiple ways that young people are learning. Are we thinking about a pedagogy around hip hop? Are we thinking about teaching literacy through positive forms of hip hop? Are we doing any role play? When we're talking about community violence, are we thinking about doing a role play and things of that nature? We're hearing that Raquel is in and ready to present. Um, thank you for, <laughs> for allowing me to have this space. Thank you so much, Izzy Lassiter for these insightful comments. Very much appreciated. I'm here. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Yes, we can hear you, Dr. Yang. Okay. Thank you very much, Berlin. You want me to start or? Yeah, uh, yes, please. Um, you have 30 minutes to uh, make your presentation. We so appreciate okay. and also happy you're able to come on. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you. If Thank I you might, so much, Berlin. If I might interrupt, I believe there's an introduction for you, Dr. Yanks. We, we uh, you can do it very briefly. We did That's the introduction right. already. That's fine. That's <laughs> wonderful. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Well, I want to say uh, good morning to everybody and thank everybody profusely for being here uh, to participate with us in the School to Prison Pipeline, which is a very, very important conference for us and should be for every one of us. As we were planning the conference, we were talking about things that we needed to put into the conference that would be relevant to the issues that we are facing in education today. And I always have felt that the missing, one of the missing links and the very important missing link in the educational system is the involvement of parents. Uh, we seem to forget that the parents are the first and most important parents that a child will ever have. And to that effect, um, you know, I have always been very interested in parental participation in the school setting because I saw firsthand how important that is in my own family. You know, I would never be where I am today if it would not have been for my parents. And I think every one of us could echo the same thing that I am saying. Uh, the schools all over the United States have been in disarray and in chaos and in crisis for a long time. As a matter of fact, you know, when I did my doctoral dissertation, uh, which is um, almost uh, 40 years ago, um, I decided to do my doctoral dissertation on parental involvement because that's how strongly I feel about parental involvement. And I had to research over 900 articles to make sure that what I was going to write about had never been written about before because, you know, that's an issue with writing a dissertation. You cannot be writing about something that somebody already wrote. And all through the literature, I found parental involvement, the importance of parental involvement, studies that have done by Harvard University, by the schools in Texas, by the schools in Florida, parental involvement is so important. And yet, when you are intimately uh, into the school situation, you find that parental involvement is absent. The only way that you see parents in school is when children are having difficulties. If a child has to be suspended or reinstated or, or expelled, it's always something negative. And 
many of our parents we know have had negative experiences with school. So they're really not that enamored about school because they don't see school as a place that is uh, welcoming and that is uh, ready to help their children and where their children are going to be supported and, and help to grow and develop intellectually, physically, and emotionally. So we start with having parents that are already a little bit skeptical about education, about sending their children to school. So I did a study of the perceptions of Puerto Ricans and Anglo parents as to their involvement in the educational process. And my study was based on the fact that, you know, the school district at that time, I hear somebody else. Am I okay? Hello? Yes. Hello? Yes, you're fine. Continue. Well, there was somebody else on the it's, line. It's just an <laughs> echo, Dr. Yanks. Okay. <laughs> Thank so you. So at, at the time when I wrote my dissertation, there uh, in the Reading School District, there were only Puerto Rican students. So that's why I chose that uh, section of the population. And so I did questionnaire and uh, I interview parents. And I found out, you know, that parents want the same thing. These parents want the same thing for their children that you and I want for our children. We want to grow up to be uh, hu decent human beings and to use their God-given potential to the best of their ability and to develop into productive citizens. So as far as that goes, all parents want the same thing for their children. Some can do it better than others, but basically that's the premise. They all want what's best for their children. Uh, interestingly enough, I have never heard of a course that is given or, or a training that is given to train people to be parents. So basically what we teach our children is what we were taught, whether it was good, bad, or indifferent. So the children learn from their parents, the parents learn from their grandparents, the grandparents learn from the great grandparents, and the cycle keeps going on. And yet, an important role as being a parent is never addressed in training or in any aspect of our educational lives. So maybe we're making the same mistakes that our parents made, or maybe we are doing great, like our parents did. So. When it comes to parental involvement, we know, as I said before, that the parents are a little bit skeptical about the schools because they have had, some of them have had not so very good experiences in the schools. The second thing is that historically, the schools have, is the domain of the superintendent, the principals, and the teachers. And you know, nobody should interfere with that domain. So when we say parental involvement, we said, okay, so let's now uh, form some parent teachers uh, associations or parent teachers group. But what we want those parents to do is probably sell cookies or have a, an ethnical dinner or uh, come in uh, at a parade to take care of the children are taking care of. It's, it's things that have very little to do with the basic education that we want our children to receive. So. When we're talking about meaningful parental involvement, we are talking about involving parents in the educational process. And you know, it's very interesting that all this has come to light uh, during this pandemic. More than ever in the history of, of our country, have we needed parents more than, than we did during the pandemic so that those parents would be able to help us, the educators, to educate their children. They send com we send computers to their homes, we send homework to their homes, we have teachers on the, on the uh, computer, but the parents were the ones that had to see to it that the children were present and that the children were doing what they were supposed to be doing. And you know what? Most parents were not doing the job because they didn't know how to do the job or they haven't, they're not used to doing the job. That is an area that they never got into. For example, the culture and the language it has a lot to do 
with our relationship with people. And in our Puerto Rican culture, for example, parents feel that the home, that the school is the second home and the teachers are the second parents. When they send their children to school, it's hand off. The school is doing the job. They're doing a great job. They love their children. They educate their children. That's what their perception is. And yet we interpret that in our Anglo culture that these people do not care about their children. There could be nothing more further from the truth. They care about their children. They don't know how to do whatever it is that we want them to do. Um, again, I would say that if parental involvement were to work, we needed to come up with ways that we have training for parents. And I'm talking about meaningful training for parents. What is it that they need to do? Because, you know, the first five years of the student life, of the children's life, the parents are the teachers. We are the ones that teach our children everything that they need to know emotionally and educationally. One of the things that always uh, comes to my mind is the fact that when a child comes to first grade, they must have a vocabulary of 500 words in order to begin reading. My experience has been that our children, black, minorities, poor, Latinos, do not have the vocabulary to even begin to read in school. Some of these children have never even had to speak. They just make gestures and the parents know what they mean, what they understand each other. But when they come to school, they don't have the vocabulary that they need to have to begin reading. So right there, our children are at a tremendous disadvantage. And that's all poor, black, Asians, whatever they are. In addition to that, we have a population that doesn't even speak English. And we are asking to come to school and begin reading a book in English when they don't even have the vocabulary. So if parents at home would be able to know that they have to develop a certain vocabulary so that their children can, in that little phase of their life, be able to come to school prepared to start reading. When I was in education, I had groups of parents that I met with in the library and I called the program, the read aloud program. And the parents at the beginning said, oh, no, 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 Dr. Yings, I, I, don't, I can't teach my children how to read. I don't know how to read myself. I said, you don't have to know how to read in order to teach vocabulary to your children. And what we did, we took the books, we asked the parents to look at the picture, and we asked the parents to tell a story about the picture that they saw and teach the vocabulary of the, pic of the pictures that were in the book. There's nothing that any parent, no matter what their educational level is, cannot do in a read aloud program where they are taught how to teach their children vocabulary. And really what they're teaching their children is the love for books, the love for reading, and be able to speak the vocabulary that's academic and that they need in the schools. Okay, so that's one thing that is very simple. It could be done. Get the parents together have a read aloud program, teach them how to teach their children the vocabulary that they need when they come to school. Again, if we want meaningful parental involvement, we need to involve the parents in a meaningful way. Not just come in for the parade, come in for, I have that echo again. <laughs> uh, anyhow. During my doctoral dissertation, I found out uh, that schools work in isolation from parental involvement. And if that there is any, it's minimal. And that there was a resistance to have the parents in the schools. The only person that the parents see when they come to school is the secretary. And the secretary, you know, is to protect the rest of the staff from these parents that are coming in. And many times, you know, it's because the parents are angry. They are upset. They don't know what's happening to their child. They don't know what it is that you expect from my child. And so because they, this misunderstanding and this lack of communication and this lack of humanity that exists among all of us today, which is incredible, is what's driving our children 
out of school because they're not able to deal with the environment. They're not able to deal with the teachers. There is a misunderstanding between the teachers and the students, the, the culture, the language, uh, the way in which they dress, all the things that have changed so rapidly in our country and has affected school is affecting the education of our children. Uh, and as I say, I saw a lack of encouragement in the part of the schools to welcome the parents to come in and work in tandem with the schools for a better education for their children. Parental involvement has different meaning to different people. You know, uh, if you have a PTA, parental uh, a parent teacher association, some people say, well, this is just to raise funds. Or some people say, well, this is just to bring food to the school when we have a, a party. Or it is to uh, dress their children for the parade. But I have not seen, and maybe some of you do, and if you do, I am happy about it, but I have not seen that the parents come to school to really be engaged in the educational process and the educational development of their children. We all know how important education is to success. We all know that. And yet our recorded. children... Just make sure you are... Yeah. How important and there's somebody else in the line. And yet our children... Um, I just lost some of my train of thought because there was somebody else on the line. Oh, someone was unmuted, Dr. Yates. He's muted now. Go ahead. You're doing a fabulous that's okay. job. Um, as I said, there's this lack of encouragement uh, to bring our parents to our school. Um, we said, I said that how important education was to success. I said that parents I found during <clears throat> my study that parents have a lack of faith in education. Uh, why should I send my child to school? He's learning nothing. He comes to school and from school and he has no books. Uh, because you know what? In some schools, and I'm talking from experience, they don't even allow the children to take the books to school, to, to the home, because those books are used from one year to the next and they, they, they lose them or they tear the pages or whatever they do. So they are not even allowed to take the books to school to study from the books. So parents don't even see those books in the home. So they're wondering, well, what is my child doing in school? I don't see any books. They might bring a paper to do a homework, but that's about it. The other thing is we send homework to, for the children to do at home. I don't have any objection to homework. I think homework is important. If children have been train at home from the beginning, the importance of school, the importance of doing homework, the importance of handing in your homework. But if that hasn't been taught from the beginning, the children have no idea, they will not do the homework. I remember so vividly a girl who was suspended from school. And every, every day that she tried to come in, the teacher would say to her, where is your excuse? And she, she didn't have the excuse. You have to go home till you bring me the excuse. So they called me to the school. And they said, Dr. Yings, this child will refuse to bring a, a, an excuse to school. And you know the rules. If she doesn't bring the, the notice from parents or as their excuse why she was out, she cannot be in school. That's the rule. So I said, all right, let me talk to the girl. So I called the girl out of the classroom and I said to her, you know, Maria Dolores, you, you're supposed to be bringing a, a note to the school. Why, why don't you bring that note and make yourself life a little bit easier? Uh, you know, if you bring that note, is there any way I can help you? The tears started to flow. And she looked at me and she said, Dr. Yings, we don't have a paper or pencil at home. My mother cannot read or write. You know, I, I could, I, I cannot tell you. Gave her paper, I gave her pencil, and I said, please take this home and have your mother uh, write 
the excuse or or somebody in your family write this you know the note these are things that i saw firsthand in schools it's not a story that i read in a book i experienced it and so you know how do we know what the situation in the home is teachers don't make home visits oh god forbid teachers don't live in the neighborhood oh god forbid teachers teach in the city and at 3:30, 4 o'clock, when the school is out, they go to their suburban homes, and those children that live in the ghettos and in the, you know, in the neighborhoods, uh, there's nobody there to talk to about school, to ask uh, any information or whatever, because there's nobody present. You know, you all know that education is one of the most difficult tasks, and that it's all in this array, and we, but we don't seem to understand the urgency, the urgency that is attached to this issue. We do not seem to understand it. And if we understand it, I don't know why it is so impossible to fix it. You know, I, I don't know who to go to to beg, please do something about the education of these children. We are losing our youth. They're dropping out of school. They're going into prison. They're going into selling drugs. The, the crime is growing by leaps and bounds. And we just don't seem to be the feeling of the urgency of this problem. I, I'm sorry to be so emotional. And so I, I don't apologize for my passion because this is what I have done all my life. Fight for these children. And you know, I feel it all goes on deaf ears because I see no no change, I see no progress. I see when when uh, the children, I, I read the other day that the Department of Education was buying a computer for each child in Pennsylvania from kindergarten up. What is that going to do for the children? You know, when when automation came, when computers came, Everybody said, oh, this is going to uh, revolutionize education and it is going to do the trick. With You know who it helped? It helped the ones that were already at the top. It, hurt, it didn't hurt, uh, help our children very much. So what is it that we need to do? And, you know, one person cannot do it. One leader cannot do it. This has to be a, a, a concerted effort of a lot of people that really believe that our children are important, that our parents are important, that education is important. I heard yesterday at a meeting that one of the schools that has a population of, uh, uh, of uh, minority children and so on has their vocational school closed for years. Where are these children going to go and get the training that they need to be productive. Not everybody is a college uh, graduate. Not everybody uh, can afford to go to college. You know, they can make as much in the trades. Why are we uh, educating our children and sending them to trade schools to be able to do the functions? You know, sometimes you want to get an electrician and you can't get an electrician, or you want to get a plumber and you can't get a plumber because they are at a premium. And so, and our children are not given even that opportunity. Many of our children might not have the, the ability to go to college, but they certainly have the dexterity to learn a trade. So again, I say to you that schools are in a state of crisis. Even 40 years ago, when I wrote my doctoral, doctoral dissertation, the things that I'm saying to you were true then, and I'm sure they are true now. I beg and implore every one of you who's listening to me today to please uh, talk to your schools, talk to your uh, politicians, talk to your senators, talk to whoever you need to talk and see if we can get people to really uh, talk about, you know, what are the problems and what do we need to do about it? Because I will I refuse to believe that this is a problem that cannot be solved. I refuse to believe that. I feel that this is an issue that can be solved if we all have the interest 
and the urgency to solve it. I know that I have been speaking too long and too much, but I like to stop. If there's anybody who has any questions, I'd be very happy to answer any questions. Hello? Hello? We can hear you, Dr. Yanks. Yes. Did you hear me? I believe I believe we have a question. Um, Asia, go ahead. You can unmute yourself and ask her if you would like. Or put it in the chat and I will address okay, it. Okay, thank you. No, I was just waiting for permission to ask. Um, Dr. Yings, thank you for your presentation. I really appreciated your passion as well. And I wanted to make that known to you. My question to you is from your work, because um, you, you referred to your dissertation, um, did you get any feedback or see any direct change in the school where you identified some of these um, barriers? I, I, I don't think I understand your question. You mean as far as my doctoral dissertation or yes. as far as the work that... Um, when I you, don't you even gave know. several examples of some of the things you identified, one which stood out to me, was the idea of how you notice students and, and parents. Parents are isolated. That really jumped out at me when it comes to the teaching, um, the educational process. The schools isolate the parents. When you identified that in your dissertation, did, did that information translate to the school in any way? Or were they able well, to read your work and make any changes? I'll tell you, I, I'm, I'm going to be very, very honest with you. I don't even know if they know that I wrote the dissertation on parental involvement because, you know, when, when I was in the school, I was like an island on myself. Okay. Uh, remember, in those days, uh, very few people were talking about uh, bilingual education or English as a second language or anything like that. So when... I had a program in the school district, but believe me, I was like an island on myself. Everybody would used to refer to the Hispanic children as Dr. Ying's children. When there was a problem, call Dr. Ying. She can solve the problem of that child. If there is a parent, call Dr. Ying. She might be able to talk to those parents. So there were very few people in the school district that were bilingual, bicultural. Uh, principals, I don't remember any. Uh, administrators. I think I was the only administrator. So, you know, I believe me, I got used to being alone with my staff doing what I needed to do, which was to teach these children English so that they could go back into the classroom and be able to get an education. So as far uh -huh. as my doctoral dissertation, I don't even know that anybody read it or saw it. Thank you for that. Appreciate it. Dr. Yanks, thank you so much for joining us. And we're so glad that the technical issue was resolved and you were able to join us even with the short notice. And we are so enlightened by what you had to share with us. So thank you so much. And I would like to introduce now Stacy Waters. Stacy Waters is Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission Education and Outreach Coordinator. She will introduce our next Sorry, guest, guest speaker. speaker. Thank you, Zalai. Brandon served as secretary of the Pennsylvania Board of Pardons from April 2019 through January 2022. During his tenure as secretary, he was responsible for modernizing Pennsylvania's executive clemency process, streamlining the board's filing and administrative review protocols, increasing the overall number of clemency applicants by more than 400% and making the executive clemency process as accessible as it has ever been since its inception in 1872. A successful recipient of a pardon himself from Governor Tom Wolf in March of 2019, prior to his appointment, Secretary Flood spent nearly a decade working for the Pennsylvania House of Representatives, where he served in a multitude of professional capacities. He is the principal founder of the Lazarus Firm LLC, which is a company 
that provides administrative support, consultation to prospective executive, executive clemency applicants deserving individuals that are seeking to expunge their criminal histories and Pennsylvania based employers that are interested in developing reentrant friendly employment screening policies. Please welcome Brandon Blood. Thank you for having me. All right, you guys can hear me on my end? Yes, yes we can. All righty. So yeah, first and foremost, Stacey, I want to thank you for extending me the invitation. Uh, thank you for uh, doing my, my biography justice. Um, I guess formatting wise, uh, you just want me to kind of speak about, you know, me more or are there questions that, to entertain on how we're doing this format wise? Anyone? So Mr. Flood, if you could just speak on your experience and speak on this very important topic and then if we have any questions at all, um, people will put it in the chat, we can address it, or we will just unmute them and address that. But tell us a little bit about yourself, about your organization, and how that ties into the school to prison pipeline and restorative justice. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, that, especially when it comes to the school to prison pipeline, obviously, that's a term or phrase that's bandied about pretty uh, frequently. Uh, I've, I've actually lived that. Uh, my first foray into the juvenile justice system happened in a school setting at William Penn. Um, what began is me not taking off my jacket in the classroom quickly escalated to me being charged with aggravated assault against a police officer. This was during the time when, as they called them, school resource officers, but police officers uh, were uh, instituted in the school setting. Um, so again, what began as merely me not taking my jacket off escalated to an aggravated assault against a police officer. Luckily, that was my first time going into the juvenile justice center, the first time uh, system rather, first time me ever going to a detention center, uh, a Schaffner uh, Youth Center uh, out Stilton. You know, um, ultimately those charges were downgraded to disorderly conduct. Um, but yeah, that was my first foray. And that began what, you know, unfortunately for me at the time, I ended up going back to Schaffner Youth Center probably about a dozen times after that. And you know, part of what is dangerous and, and that we have to be mindful of when we talk about the school to prison pipe, pipeline is there are a ton of children who enter that system and become hardened, right? They don't go, they don't necessarily, they're not necessarily hardened when they first make that their, their foray into that system. It's, you know, once they get around different people, once they uh, almost become desensitized to, you know, what the environment was, we all hear what the perception of prison or detention is, but to be there, for me, speaking personally, when I got there, uh, it wasn't that bad, can, you know, to, to be perfectly frank, other than you being locked in your cell, uh, they had a lot of, uh, they had a lot of, uh, you know, television, games, you know, we were children too, so you know, snacks and whatnot. So, you know, especially when we talk about in, in America, the juvenile justice system, at least when it comes to detention, it wasn't as bad as it was represented to me. So that began, what started for me was a uh, a very lengthy juvenile history. As I said, I ended up going to Schaffner Youth Center probably about 12 times after that. Ended up going to two placements, a high impact boot camp for juveniles at uh, Northwestern Academy, and then a long-term or intermediate to long-term uh, institution at, uh, at Abraxas up in Marionville. And that carried over into adulthood, right? So I had already had this juvenile criminal history. I was already kind of knee deep in uh, that criminogenic thinking and, and activity. So that carried over into adulthood. And that led to me going out Dalton County Prison, ultimately led to me incurring a, a two to four year sentence as a 17 year old, uh, and then a subsequent five to 10 year sentence. So um, I, I lived that, that, that school to prison pipeline, but luckily for me, I was able to kind of extricate myself from that pipeline, um, so to speak. Uh, it, was, it was during my second sentence, that five to 10 year sentence, um, when I was released in February of 2010, I was kind of bit by the, the political bug. Uh, at that time, I understood how systems work, understood how I got ensnared in it, and understood how the system was meant to keep me, you know, within the system, you know, to keep this recurring, um, this recurring process, you know, in, in place. 
So uh, when I left prison, it was, you know, if I wanted to get into politics or government, there wasn't a better place for me to go to as Harrisburg is the epicenter of government in, in the Commonwealth. So my whole mission at that point in 2010 was to scare up an internship. At the time, Linda Thompson, who was uh, Harrisburg's first uh, mayor uh, of color, she was the mayor. I was trying to get an internship with her. Unfortunately, that didn't work. But what my secondary plan, I ended up getting an internship with the House, Pennsylvania House of Representatives. Um, at the time, it was State Representative, uh, what is his name? Drawing a blank. It's been a while. There was a Frank Oliver Sr. from Philadelphia. He, I never met the man. I, I merely emailed him, told him what you know, my interests were, and he, he provided a way for me to, uh, to, to intern in his office. And to this, you know, he's deceased now, but I've never met him in person. And this is where opportunities certainly uh, come into play. And for me, it was just a matter of just opening the door up for me. Open the door up for me, let me get a foot in, and I'll do the rest. And that's exactly what happened. Ended up getting an internship, ended up getting hired on probably about a, a full time, about a month into my internship. Another Philly legislator, uh, Vanessa Brown, ended up working for her on and off for five years, progressed through the legislature, really learned how systems work, right? I, was, I became a sponge during that time. Um, I knew this was a field that I wanted to stay in. So now I was the first person in the office, last person out. You know, so for me, I, at that point, it was just a matter of building up the government. Again, we talk about, about the, past, the past, all of the all negativity, of the negativity that they associated with me. I felt like I was compensating for that and making up for that. So long story short, ended up progressing through the legislature, a number of different capacities, ended up leaving in 2017 uh, to go into private industry, ended up serving as a uh, SCIU, Service Employees International Union. I believe they represent folks at the Human Relations Commission. Ended up, rep ended up rep being their legislative director, uh, SEIU is the second largest public sector union in Pennsylvania. Uh, ended up coming back to government, ended up working for the Department of Standing House. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be able to, to change systems and create systems. So I ended up working for the Department of General Services for about a year, as Stacy alluded to. Uh, it was during my time working with the legislature. I never knew anything about the executive clemency or the pardon process. The only, most of our frame of reference when we think of pardons is on the federal level, right? When we hear the president, usually when during the twilight of the president's administration, you hear about these mass pardons and commutations being issued. So for most Americans, most Americans frame of reference is, or their, their uh, belief is that unless you know the president, unless you're well connected somehow, unless you know Kim Kardashian, uh, you know, or Lil Wayne or someone, that you, you, you're, you know, a pardon is not within your grasp. So I learned that each state has their own process. Uh, so uh, it was so in, was in that that I ended yep. up submitting my own application for a pardon. Again, by that time, you know, again, I, I felt like, and I still do to, to some extent today, feel like I'm overcompensating for all that time I spent in prison in that juvenile justice system. So I, I, I submitted a, a pretty compelling application. Stacy, <laughs> a successful, being a successful recipient of a pardon from Governor Wolf, March 17th of 2019. Um, and for me, that's all I wanted, right? I just wanted to be able to push that restart button. Admittedly, my plan at that time was I wanted to go to Harrisburg. And <coughs> on the call now that in Pennsylvania, if you have, if you've been convicted of a felony conviction or certain misdemeanor convictions, you're constitutionally prohibited from, from running for office. So my five-year plan was to get that pardon in and be able to run for mayor last election cycle. Lo and behold, you know, I had ended up cultivating a relationship with all of the lieutenant gubernatorial candidates back in 2019. Uh, nice. If, if I may interject really quickly before, because it's, it's directly related to what you shared initially, and then I'll let you continue that thought. But Stacy has a really good question. She has her hand raised. Oh, Stacey. feel free to interject because I can go on for days. <laughs> okay, can everyone hear me? Yes. Yes. Good. Yes. So yeah, um, and, and I know you can go on, but it and and that's a good thing. So really, give a lot of um your knowledge about the collateral consequences of adjudication slash conviction. Um, uh, I think you're in a really good position because you can speak firsthand to your experience as an adjudicated youth. Um, 
Right. And if I, if memory serves me correctly, Mr. Flood, um, you were up at South, South Mountain, correct? Correct, correct. Okay, and I had a, the benefit. Cornell Companies actually um, operate South Mountain, and I am directly from D DOC, as you know, um, and I also worked for Cornell Companies. I did not work at South Mountain, but I really would like you to speak to what it has been like, what your journey has looked like as an adjudicated youth till now. Um, so if you were to speak more about, you know, those consequences, we would love to hear about that because as oh, Dr. Sure. Yanks had stated, and I don't think you were on yet, but she spoke from her knowledge as a, um, a doctoral candidate and now a, a, a doctor of, uh, who, who has an uh, ED, um, a, you know, a doctorate in education. She can speak to that from that frame of reference, but we'd like to hear what those consequences look like and um, see what you could give us as your thoughts in regard to best practices on how, where do you go from um, here uh, when, when things like that occur? So sure, yeah, sure. share so, as so, much knowledge as you, as you like, please. So one so thing one folks have to be aware of is when it comes to uh, adjudications and how they can be expunged, what that process looks like. Uh, and, and the way that the law, is, uh, way that statute is currently written is that as long as you weren't convicted of a, a sexual or violent offense, or excuse me, adjudicated of a sexual or violent offense, uh, five years after uh, your, your last adjudication, you can apply or you can petition the court for expungement unless you incur a new conviction. So it's not sexual, not violent in nature, five years after as long as five years elapses from your last adjudication, you're able to petition the court directly to get your record clear. If you don't fit that criteria, that 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 uh, adjudication sticks with you unless you receive a pardon. Um, you know, and that's what happened with me. So, you know, and those come up when someone runs a background check. Uh, you know, and a lot of people use different sources. If if you go to if you use the 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 portal. Well, sometimes if you use what's known as the uh, Pennsylvania Unified Judicial Portal, many of you may be familiar with that, where you can go on there, literally put someone's name, birthday, county, 10 seconds, you can look up dockets, right? Even though that portal is not meant to be used for background check purposes, that's what employers and decision makers use uh, because it's free. Uh, th there's nothing that stops you from using that. There's no checks and balances. So that's how it can directly impact you too, is those public accessible dockets. And many, and many times those, those adjudications are listed in those dockets. So they can affect you from anywhere from employment or school, licensing. Uh, I've seen a number of those cases, especially not only as a uh, as secretary, but in my current capacity with the Lazarus firm, you have a number of people who may have forgotten, right? They may have stayed in one field or worked in one industry for most of their life. Now they wanna make a pivot. And now that juvenile history is coming back to haunt them. Um, so that's part of the work that I do is, you know, uh, there's some folks that fit that criteria that you heard me say earlier. They've been five years removed from that last adjudication. So it is as simple as just petitioning the court. So, you know, when it comes to petitioning the court versus going through the pardon process, it's a completely different process. Going through the courts directly, it's a pretty quick process in a matter of, you know, maybe three, three months, three to six months tops, whereas for the pardon process, it can be anywhere between a year to three years, depending upon the nature of the offense. So, yeah, those adjudications, they have as great an impact as, um, as a, an adult conviction. So in my case, I had, you heard me mention about having, being out Schaffner and going to these juvenile uh, uh, long, long, short term, short -term replacements. Replacements. I didn't get my juvenile history uh, expunged until two years ago. I'm 39 years old. So, you know, stuff that I did from the time when I was in my teens were still with me until my, my mid to late thirties. So if I can jump in, uh, Mr. Flood, can you talk about the collateral consequences from a personal standpoint? How, how might your adjudication have impacted you? Well, for me, and I like to say, and I don't know if it was just that, that I was blessed or, or you know, just, uh, you know, I wrote, to be perfectly honest, in my personal case, I never really had too many issues with my conviction. But the, the, the difficult thing about being able to assess whether or not it's impacted you is you never know if someone 
if you if you incurred an adverse decision, they may say it was due to my qualifications, right? That, you know, not my convictions or my adjudication. So, in the, in that sense, I, I don't know how it was uh, how it directly impacted me. But in terms of directly, I was blessed enough that you know, even from a professional standpoint, I was able to uh, eke out a pretty uh, a successful professional career prior to getting the pardon. Uh, the reason why I put in for a pardon, and this is important for anyone, even for people who may have adjudications that they want to get off, is you never know what opportunity may emerge down the line where it will impact you, right? So, right. so yeah, I was, yeah, able, I was to able to go to years in state government state. without having any issues. But if I was to make a pivot elsewhere, if I was especially now going into business for myself, and if I'm looking at possible federal contracts or you know needing a clearance, especially on a federal level, those things matter. So. You know, part of why I do what I do now, especially, you know, through my firm is even though I charge folks a nominal cost, now it's free. You know, one of the things I did before I left this secretary is I made it abundantly clear on our, you know, and revamped that website where you can, you can file your own part in yourself if you, if you have the time and, and energy to do so. But as you know, we live in a microwave society. Folks can make their own hamburgers at home, right? But they'd rather go to McDonald's and do it because it's more efficient, right? So I like to fancy myself as kind of the McDonald's of record clearance, so to speak. Um, but yeah, for those that are, you know, may have adjudications that haven't impacted them or convictions that haven't impacted them yet, don't just look at that and, and say, hey, there's no need for me to clear this because, you, again, you never know what opportunities may emerge down the line where it will have an adverse impact. Great advice. And I have a hand up, uh, Gerline, if you could. Yes. Yeah, so. Um, I, I really like this format. Um, I think your presentation um, holds itself very well for that well, kind of dialogue. Um, um, so I don't know why there is an echo. Um, my question is going back to that first conviction uh, where you, it was just because you didn't want to take off your coat or your jacket and something happened. Do you think you were going down that path anyway? Or do you think that situation precipitated uh, your involvement in the criminal, in the juvenile criminal justice system? Yeah, I would have to say the, the latter, but the, the issue was even the, the way that, that that I was charged, right, in the grading. You know, you heard me say earlier about eligibility, right? So even, so what, luckily for me, it got downgraded to a, uh, a disorderly conduct, but if it were an aggravated assault, as I said, that would have impacted me to where I wouldn't have been able to have it expunged until I went through that part in process. So yeah, I mean, around that time, I was around I was around 13. I was about fairness even back then. So what happened in that classroom was there was another young lady in the classroom who had her jacket on. My teacher told me to take mine off. I was about, I was about equity and fairness and said, hey, well, she should have to take hers off. But unbeknownst to me, she was pregnant at the time. So she, she had an exception. Um, and the teacher obviously didn't want to vocalize that in the classroom. So, you know, me not taking it off, you know, and at the time it was, you know, the irony of all of this is, was actually the chief of the police at the time for Harrisburg City, uh, uh, Charles Dillard. Um, he was the person who was the one I got into the altercation with. And then when I, you know, fast forward maybe 20 years later, when I ended up working at the Capitol, he was the director of Capitol Police. You know, I ended up walking up to him in the uh, cafeteria and asked him, did he remember who I was? And I obviously told him that I've, I've made some, uh, some strides since that time. But yeah, to answer your question, I think that it, it, it certainly precipitated that uh, just because of the guys I was around. Um, I, I certainly didn't fancy myself as a violent person. So, um, uh, you know, if anything, I was involved in you know, obviously drug, you know, drug activity, but certainly not violent behavior. So um, I know other people want to ask questions. So I just really, because we're talking about the school to prison pipeline, right? So I, I want to make sure that everyone here understands uh, coming from someone with personal experience, how the school to prison pipeline operated to your demise in that arena. 
you mentioned how um, you became hardened and how you felt like it wasn't that big of a deal. Uh, it's, yeah, can I mean, you ex explain that impact and how that can be, um, that might have been uh, the same experience for, for others similarly situated? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Like I said, I'm speaking about myself personally, but for, you know, we talk about zero tolerance policies in schools, right? Where, you know, it's been shown um, time and time again, folks are being criminal, students are being criminalized for, you know, misbehavior, um, just common misbehavior. And, and, and in my case, yeah, although I may have been going down that road outside of, you know, later on down in life, uh, there's folks that engage in, you know, childish behavior or, maybe just an afterthought, right? You know, there's been instances where a kid has been charged and arrested for bringing scissors to school, you know, unbeknownst to them. So those, you know, so it comes down to the policies that kind of, to your point, precipitate that for people who otherwise did not have any inclination to um, in engage in criminal behavior or to enter that system. Um, for me, at that point, it becomes about exposure too. You heard me talking about once I went to that system, we end up going around different, especially when I went to juvenile placements, I got to meet kids my age from different walks of life, different uh, different places, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh. And we really used that as an, an opportunity to network about how to become better criminals, right? You know, because they exposed me to ideas and different, uh, different strategies to make money and different ways to make money that I never thought about and that I would never have thought about had I not had that exposure. So exposure is key, and that's why you see a lot of these diversionary programs because it's been it's been proven when you when you introduce someone who otherwise does not have uh, inclination to engage in either uh, serious criminal conduct or violent criminal conduct, when they're exposed to to to, to folks of that ilk, they tend to take on those, those characteristics and, and those behaviors. Thank you. Gloria Richardson has a question. Gloria? Yes, Mr. Flood, I was wondering if you talk about that now your role is trying to help folks get those pardons to clear their names. Um, is it affordable for someone to go through this process if they're not able to write it themselves? Is this an affordable process? Because I know a lot of times people a barrier is created because of financial. Right. No. So yeah, for me, it is. I mean, you know, part of what, what I, I guess what the niche that I'm carving out is I'm really tailoring our, my services to a, a very specific subset of the population that has criminal records, right? Because you have a ton of nonprofits that are helping people that live, who either live at the poverty line or live below it for free. Uh, obviously, if you have money and you're well off, you, you can afford to hire an attorney and pay four or $5,000. But if you're a middle class, hardworking person, you don't, who doesn't have thousands of dollars or doesn't live or, or, uh, or, or, living, or, under, or living at or under the poverty line, you're, you're kind of in that donut hole. So that's, that's the folks that I'm targeting. Um, and for me, we even offer payment plans. There, there'll never be an instance where I would say, hey, I'm not going to take your case because you don't have enough money as well obviously as long as you put a down payment down you know and that can be anything i'm very flexible in that um because to your point it's about accessibility the only time that i would i would that i would refuse to take someone's case um is if i don't feel like they're a viable candidate because it's, it's not fair to to them to give them false hope and more importantly you know the, the sweat equity and energy that i'm putting into the preparation of an application that i know is non-viable you know, it's not a prudent use of resources, but yeah, it's kind of like almost with those, uh, you know, you go to the used car lots and they say everyone's approved, literally everyone's approved here if you're, if you're a viable candidate. And, you know, for what attorneys charge thousands of dollars for, I charge a couple hundred dollars for it. Obviously, having that institutional knowledge of how the process works, you know, admittedly also being able to have a hand in simplifying that process. Now, I kind of go by the amount of energy that I'm expending. So if it takes me 30 minutes to do your application, why the hell would I charge you thousands of dollars? For? So that's kind of the model that we have here. So it is very affordable. No one would be turned away. And we also do have pro bono cases, too, especially for, for seniors, too, um, because same thing. You, you have that school to prison pipeline affects people 
seniors who incurred convictions or adjudications, you know, um, when they were children, you know, and, and then that affects their ability to be able to live in uh, publicly, uh, public, uh, publicly accessible housing, right, or public assisted housing. Um, so we help with expungement. A lot of those expungement petitions I do or help them with are, are done on a pro bono basis. No problem. Thank you so much for that work. Absolutely. So the previous speaker was uh, really touching on meaning, meaningful parenting and the roles of parents and how it is everything to educating our children. We had a question in the chat by um, one of our colleagues, Anthony Way, who says, what role did your family play in your reintegration after you were released? That's a good question. So I'm, I'm going to approach that from two places. So number one, the influence that they had that, you know, prior to me entering that system, um, I was right. I was unique in the sense that I was raised by a single father, you know, college educated, military man. Uh, mother wasn't in a life that in my life that, 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 that much. So I had all of the instructions. I had all the rudimentary, you know, knowledge. You know, I just decided not to apply. I was a very, I always considered myself an iconoclast even back then. So you you tell me the conventional way to do it, I'm always going to explore the, the unconventional way or the Brandon way of doing things. So, you know, um, while I, again, I didn't utilize that information when I was a youth, when I did decide to make that pivot, I was able to do it more seamlessly than some of my peers who didn't have that, that foundational, um, those foundational qualities. In terms of me being released and, and how that impacted me. Um, so my father actually passed before I was released my second go around. And, you know, obviously he, he was around and saw me enter that juvenile system and uh, as an adult, you know, so I was telling him my plans before I left the, 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 the second sentence, right? You know, I'm sure he looked at me with skepticism and thought a lot of what I was saying was BS. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, that he was supportive, at least in that sense, saying, hey, if you're really gonna do, you know, I, every time I came home from prison, Housing was always available. I mean, if there was no one else, every, anywhere else I could go, certainly it was with my father. So housing is a big key, right? Because you can't really focus on getting a job and getting situated if you don't know, if you don't have a stable roof over your head, right? So uh, he, he's, he's, he had always been um, supportive in that sense. Again, I've always had the rudiments from as a child. He, was, he made me get a job at Hershey Park. So I knew how to put a resume together. I knew how to interview. I had those soft skills. So a lot of stuff he taught me as a youth, you know, that kind of carried over. Again, the, the tools were all, always there. I just never applied them. Uh, so the, my last sentence, you know, I decided to apply them. So that that's that's how um, I would say he was supportive in that sense. And certainly. I wasn't one of those people who I wasn't going to use the excuse to, hey, my father's passed. So now it gives me an excuse to just kind of, you know, run wild and amok. Um, if anything, I use that as fuel to say, hey, listen, you know, let me, uh, he didn't get a chance to see me do right, you know, so let me still honor that, that, that commitment, you know, even, you know, following his passing. That's beautiful that you are still honoring his memory through the way you are living and how you've managed to just overcome those obstacles and become a better person as a result of what you've been through and also what you're giving back to people who have been in similar situations. So our conference is really focused on restoration, right? And it's as if you've done the work to restore the route in which you were going and restore everything that was lost during your time when you were incarcerated, speak to what restoration looks like for the youth that may be facing what you're facing and how we can take the route to positive educational outcomes with respect to our youth that are facing these unsurmountable obstacles as well. Yeah, I think one effective method that hasn't really been utilized or maybe um, just hasn't been utilized in the right way is really helping young people to find what their passion is. You heard me say at the top of my commentary, I was bitten by the political bug, right? So I had a father who was telling me, hey, you're going, you should go to the military. He was kind of laying out what the groundwork or what my life was supposed to look like versus saying, hey, what is it that you care about? What are you good at? Or exposing me to things where I could actually discover what I excel at and what I enjoy. And for me, 
it just so happened to be that second, that second, that five to 10 year sentence where I discovered uh, government, you know, I had a state senator come up and really gave us some straight talk and talked about how the legislative process works, what his colleagues say about us behind bars. You know, so when I found out what my passion was, and once I, you know, again, once I was bitten at it by that bug, I knew that's what I wanted to do. So the earlier, obviously, if I was, if I knew that earlier, and I was around, maybe I was around 27, 26, 27, when I, I arrived at that, or had that epiphany, so to speak. So I think the earlier that we're able to help people find or assist our youth with finding what their passions are, or exposing them to different things where they can discover what they're good at or what they excel at, and number, you know, more importantly, if they're able to monetize what they're actually good at doing, um, I think you'll 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 see better outcomes in terms of the diverting folks. Um, so for me, that that's what was key was find out what I was passionate about. Uh, rest of, from a restoration standpoint, um, no, I still, as I said earlier, to some extent, I still feel like I'm compensating for you know all that time lost um, because uh, and I'm, I'm no, I know at the time when I was beginning my second sentence, my, my little sister, she told me, she said, all oh, this time you spent in jail, you would already had a, you know, a doctorate already, or at least your master's um, or your the law degree, you know, and I, and I, and I, that, that felt, I felt that, right? So, you know, I take this time and that's why I, I try to be in everything and be everywhere, be omnipresent because I still feel like I'm compensating for that. And largely a lot of that has to do with me feeling like, well, at least, I mean, it's kind of borne itself out today. Most people don't associate me with being an ex-offender or, or a reentrant. You know, and a lot of people still don't know. And I, and I actually get a lot of people who tell me, hey, why don't you speak more to that? And it's not that I'm reluctant to do so. It's just that, again, I've done enough work to where I didn't just want to restore, you know, what, what was lost, but also wanted to, to add on to that, right, or to exceed those expectations. And I feel like that's, that's an ongoing process. And that's just who I am. I'm just a restless person. That's definitely admirable. And we have another question. Uh, Asia, go ahead and ask your question. Hi, Mr. Flood, good to see you again. Uh, we have communicated, I wanna say first, many times in my role as a uh, juvenile life or mitigation specialist, I've also had to really, really do some advocacy on the side for clemency for a couple lifers. And I want you to know your professionalism, the way you respond to just ordinary community people trying to get something done for people behind walls was always appreciated. So I wanna give you kudos for being a decent professional because people get to Harrisburg and lose their minds about how to respond to people who don't have titles. And I wanna thank you for treating people like people when you were in that role. Um, my question though is um, giving, I have followed your career, I was very much um, aware that you had the experiences you had from numerous forms I've heard you speak on. So my question is now that you're in transitioning to the Lazarus firm and um, doing your own thing, have you figured out a way that the Lazarus firm can serve or have an initiative that would be more supportive to youth and PA schools, particularly black and brown youth who are being expelled at a at a higher rate, suspended at a higher rate. Do you see anything your firm can do that parents would be able to say, hey, let me get the Lazarus firm involved or educators can say, how can I, how can the Lazarus firm help me with this issue? No, that's, that's a, a great question. And, you know, thank you for, for the, the uh, for, you know, um, for the compliments too um, and the warm sentiments. You know, from, I want to address the first part. You know, part of me being, I guess, as I always pride at myself. When I look at a public official, I look at two things, right? That, I, that's kind of what I use as the metric to assess how effective they are, how responsive they are, and how accessible they are. So you know, those are two things that I've always prided at myself on. And just kind of watching, you know, especially when I first got into government, and just kind of just sat back and watched how people operate, how people treated people. You know, and at the time too, and I didn't mention when I was in government, most people didn't know I had, well, 99% of the people didn't know I had a criminal conviction until I got appointed as a board secretary. So I would always hear people, both Democrats and Republicans alike, they would talk a lot of, you know, would, would speak very, in a very demeaning and denigrating way 
when it came to people who were involved in the justice system. And they would talk to me about it too, right? And I would just sit there and listen and be like, oh, that's, that's, how, that's how y'all feel. Um, so just kind of absorbing that and observing that I wanted to do the opposite, you know? So that's who I am at my core and I'm glad, I uh, appreciate you acknowledging that. In terms of the, the second question you asked, I think that's a great idea. Um, you know, obviously, you know, I wanna be able to provide assistance to those that have uh, encountered the misfortune of entering the justice system, but the goal is to prevent them from entering the system to begin with, right? So that pre-entry side. So uh, that is some, uh, in, a, in a perfect world and ideally what will happen with the Lazarus frame is we're gonna to pivot to a nonprofit model. Obviously I'm doing what I'm doing now, just kind of, uh, right now I'm just kind of uh, pushing the reset button and, and you know, uh, considering what my next options will be. Um, but ideally what I want to do is pivot to a nonprofit model. Uh, but obviously that's going to take training people and having folks to, to have that expertise to be able to scale what, what, what I'm doing presently. But uh, I absolutely would. You know, one of the biggest things that I want to do that I've yet to do, unfortunately, is I haven't gone back to those juvenile facilities that I went through. Um, and that's something that I want to do and be able to speak to that population because, you know, hope, hope goes a long way, right? And I know when I first got my, uh, my first felony conviction as an adult, I assumed that I was going to have to bear that conviction for the rest of my life. And most people do. It's kind of like once you get in, you, you kind of reach that uh, point of no return, that Rubicon, and you're like, hey, I might as well, you know, go all in. So that's something that I definitely want to do and I'm, I'm certainly considering as, uh, as, like I said, I further assess what the, the next step will be in terms of what this business model looks like for the last response. But that's a suggestion. Thank you for that. So my question to you is what is the Bandbox initiative? And can you speak on that? Yeah, absolutely. So the ban the box policy is a policy that was developed, I believe first started uh, coming into prevalence in the late 2000s. Uh, and the ban the box policy essentially, much like the name suggests, it removes that box, that question from the application and asks about. You just muted yourself. And, um, and what that too, and it's, not, it's probably by design is, it's easy to screen you out, right? We don't even have to look at the qualifications or anything else, especially if I'm a small mom and pop business and I get 80 applications, the easy thing to, for me to do is just to you know, toss the ones, you know, swipe left for the ones that have checked that yes box. So what the ban the box policy does is it removes that question from the application. It doesn't, it doesn't remove it from the employment screening process. And, and the premise behind that is, is you, one based upon their qualifications for the position first, and then you can explore that, that criminal history question uh, on a secondary or tertiary basis, right? Because uh, by the time that you get to that point, you would already know, hey, this person is more than suitable for this position, and maybe, in, and despite this criminal conviction, maybe we, we, there's a workaround there. Um, so that's something that I was very instrumental in getting the city of Harrisburg uh, to enact. Uh, I believe that might've been 2013. And again, you know, this was during a time when, you know, a lot of people just thought I was very sympathetic <laughs> criminal justice reform and these kind of issues, um, but didn't know that I was directly impacted by that. So I wanna shout out our current mayor uh, or Harrisburg City's current mayor, uh, Wanda Williams. She had given me the platform um, to, to come before council to make a compelling argument and they saw the value of it and enacted it uh, very shortly thereafter was also able to get Governor Wolf uh, to do the same thing. Obviously, it's a little bit more difficult for me to try to get something passed into law um, that would have applied statewide, but it's a little bit, it was easier for me to go through the governor and say, hey, can you issue an executive order uh, applying ban the box to all uh, Commonwealth employment as well as civil service employment. Obviously, there's certain carve outs for that because there are certain positions where you should know uh, from the outset, whether or not someone has a conviction. Obviously, if we're talking about law enforcement, we're talking about you know the healthcare um, industry, or we're talking about at the education field, you know, uh, there's carve outs for that. But outside of those instances where someone will be working with vulnerable populations or dealing with sensitive information, um, you should level that playing field. Um, so that's what the ban the box policies are. 
of Philadelphia has been very, uh, they've probably been the most aggressive, not probably, they have been the most aggressive in Pennsylvania. They actually, there's a citywide policy for any businesses that have 10 or more employees that ban the box policy is, is applicable. So uh, again, it's about fairness and allowing folks to be judged based upon their qualifications first and not the collaterally those, those uh, criminal convictions or adjudications. So with your, I don't see any other questions in the comments section just yet, but I do have uh, someone in our audience who says they were completely unaware of who you were until today and already have so much respect for you, uh, really making, you know, things in regards to your own restoration and the options that may be available is relatable to many of us that are tuning in. And no, Deborah Bryce, she wanted to know if he was saying ban the box. It's ban, B-A-N, the box initiative. So yeah. what would you say on a personal level, I just wanted to ask, what would you say has been the highlight of your political tenure? And now that you have established the Lazarus firm, what are you most proudest of? The life a lie if you don't mind me jumping in there is a question and, it, and it's from Gregory I see okay. Gregory did you want to ask her or can I yeah, go I'll, ahead I'll go ask ahead. it so uh first of all before I start asking my question I am just very appreciative of the time that you're taking with us and amazed by your story I used to work for the office of children youth and family and one of the major things that we had um the initiative to was to find out what was the best way to help children reintegrate into community. So what advice would you give the child residential facilities to help improve that process on their end? Uh, I think it's something that has been sorely lacking is uh, mentorship, right? You know, partnering uh, youth with people. Again, this kind of goes back to identifying what passions are, right? So if I know I want to, if I have a, a if I want to go into the legal field as a 12-year-old, partner me with someone who's already in that field, right? Someone who's relatable, right? You don't have to be a square to be a lawyer. And that's for me too, you, you know, part of what I, I what I learned later in life is if I don't like the way that a system is designed or the way a, the way a certain culture that's been established is, I need to penetrate that system, right? And make those changes or infiltrate that system, so to speak. And that was one of the biggest things for me is when I was released from prison in 2010 is, I was very intentional about going into government because I'd never really seen too many reentrants in the governmental space. Um, certainly a lot of folks that have done some great work as entrepreneurs, especially in, in the truck driving field, you know, other, other spheres of influence, but not in that governmental space. So I think mentorship is key. Um, you know, luckily for me, when I did start working for the House of Representatives, there was one guy in particular, and he was helpful in me getting an internship too, a guy named Rodney Oliver. Um, he was the person, when I told him what my passion was, he was an executive director for a committee there. So he was the one who would give me assignments, give me little things and pointers to, to help kind of sharpen my blade or homework, so to speak, right? So uh, again, I, I felt like I was at a disadvantage and I was trying to compensate for that disadvantage. Uh, I would take a lot of stuff home with me on that weekend. Um, that way I could at least be on par with my peers or if not, uh, have a greater knowledge base than them. So that mentorship goes a long way. And I know there's a lot of turnover um, when it comes to mentorship. Um, but I think, you know, if, if there's a way to ensure that folks are able to identify that passion and, and can be partnered with someone who's already operating in that space, there will be some favorable outcomes. Excellent. We had another question by Arian. Arian Bethea is out of our Philadelphia regional office. Arian? Yes. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Mr. Flood, thanks, um, thanks for coming. Appreciate the information. Uh, this is really exciting. I'm definitely uh, you know, happy to uh, be in on this program. It's really good and interesting, a lot of information. One of the things that's coming up and definitely from you talking is that I know programs and assistance for our, for people in regards to pardon, getting pardons, you know, exalved and all and all of that and, and race and such. But um, I guess often the difficulty is kind of where to get access to the information 
and how can we pass it on to people that we know may be aware of it. Um, and this office itself, even times in pre-pandemic when we had more direct interactions with people, that would be something that persons would come in here all the time. And previously we had to direct them to the city because it was like the band, the box stuff was something that we weren't fully engaged in addressing. And I don't know how much that has changed and resolved. I mean, I know the, you know, I know at ED, you know, he's trying to move and get a lot of things forward and moving in here, whatever. But, you know, I know it takes some time. So what's the best route so far as getting this information and access to information so that we can pass it on to people, whether they come here directly at our office or whether they're um, personal family and friends that we're trying to get engaged. And this has come up more since this most recent election. I mean, it's always been around, but we just seen it in a more recent election. And that was something that I really didn't have enough information when I was even trying to get people to register to vote. I think the first place, and thank you for the question, the first place I would send them to is the, the Board of Pardons website. Um, and that's okay. .bop.pa.gov, but keyword PA Board of Pardons. You know, one okay. of the things I did when I was as secretary was to revamp that website because, again, I went and when I went through the process as a as a pardon applicant, I found that even as someone who had worked in the legal, uh, right, quasi legal field, I found it to be very intimidating, right? And I, I saw mm -hmm. it to outsource it to attorneys because it was almost a con, it was a very daunting process. So we wanted to make it more user friendly, tons of resources, videos, instructions, and even resources that aren't necessarily related to pardons, right? Because you talked about there's different mechanisms mm -hmm. to clear one's record, whether that's directly through expungement, whether that's through ARD, whether that's through sealing, clean slate, um, and also pardons. But also in the meantime, not everyone is, is, is a suitable candidate at this time for a pardon. So what can you okay. do in the meantime while you have this conviction? So we, we even there's even information on there about knowing your rights and navigating the workforce with the criminal conviction. So the first place I would send them to would be the Board of Pardons website because it's chock full of, of information. And obviously okay. secondarily, I would refer them to, you know, obviously my website, uh, you know, the, the Lazarus Firm, you know, www.thelazarusfirm.com. Uh, again, as Asia mm -hmm. said- Writing them down, <laughs> writing, even though we're gonna play this again, but I'm still writing them down. <laughs> as Asia said, you know, um, you know, most, like I said, I get free consultations, right? And I, I'm a very candid person. So I'm going to tell you exactly what your options are. And I'll tell you if I don't feel like you're suitable at this time. But the one thing I don't do is say, hey, you're not suitable. Kick rocks. I say you're not suitable. And here's what you should do. I essentially give you kind of a, a, a roadmap for if you do these things, you should maybe come back during, you know, come back later and you'll have a higher probability. So those will be the two resources that, that I refer folks to. Thank you. That was really helpful. I appreciate that. Thank you. My pleasure. Asia, did you have another question? Your hand yeah. is up. Yes. Um, very quickly, I just wanted to ask like a, a question that's not so business oriented. Um, as a person with your experience, you're not old and you're not young, right? So you've lived long enough. <laughs> You've lived long enough to see that what we call millennials or this, this young age um, generation, they are very different from us, you know, in a lot of ways. So what if, what way or how, how will you as a person with your experiences, as well as your career changes, um, what's the first thing you would say to a 14 year old today who's in that place of, I see the violence in my neighborhood. They want me to go to school. I don't know what to do. Right. Um, that's a great question. And I think it's fitting too. I mean, you, you see the, the guy I have behind me up on the wall here. That, that's one of my muses, right? That was one of the people during my second sentence. I read the autobiography of Malcolm X and that was life-changing for me because that was the first example where I saw someone who was similarly situated as I was, you know, had gone through the system and was able to make that transfer, that positive transformation and not just impact his immediate community, but, but uh, the global community. And one of the ways he was effective at doing that, because mind you, you know, Malcolm X didn't have uh, necessarily formal education, was communication, right? And I think the, the better communicators that we can produce or make and our, our, our help our young people to become 
um, the better off they'll be, right? You know, uh, I think Warren Buffett said it recently too, the, the most uh, essential skill set to have these days is not necessarily a specialized degree from a college, but uh, be an effective communicator. Because whether you're a mechanic or you're a CEO, if you're able to communicate effectively uh, and, and be able to, to uh, harness that power of persuasion, that'll take you far. Same thing for me. And I think a lot of, when you talked about millennials, uh, <laughs> I'm gonna give you one case and example too, uh, one example in, in, in particular. So I had someone's mom, someone's mother reached out to me about her young son, I believe he's 17. He had got caught with a, a firearm, a legal firearm, it just was in the car. So she asked me, is there any way I can reach out to the district attorney, help him out? So I uh, told him to inbox me you know, on Facebook. So he inboxed me and the name of his, on his Facebook page, like his, his actual username was um like, I can't remember exactly, but like John two guns up James, right? And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> you might, let's start with you changing the name on your, 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 your page, right? Because if you're trying to say, hey, listen, I'm not a gun toting person or I don't, I'm not a gun aficionado, this was just a mistake here. You know, your, your actions and your actual name here, or at least the moniker you use isn't representative of that. Same thing with emails too. You have some folks that have some very uh, provocative emails, right? And it's like, hey, you can't expect someone to take you seriously um, if you're not taking yourself serious. And it kind of goes back to what I said earlier too. I'm not asking you to be a stick in the mud. If the culture is, hey, we want you to dress this way or be this way or present yourself this way, you do that in the meantime until you can infiltrate that system and be able to to, to moderate that that culture, right? Or to make it more, uh, you know, modernized or or more progressive. I think that's the key is, is communication. I think we, especially that we live in a very interpersonal, inter, uh, I guess, uh, impersonal life, so to speak, right? We Everything's virtual and people are largely communicating through these social media platforms. The art of being an effective communicator is kind of uh, going by the wayside, especially when you're interfacing with someone directly, or as you say, in a business sense or professional sense. And I guess you can also say when we talk about gun violence too, right? Being able to resolve conflict. Uh, Same thing for me. One thing that folks may not know is I, I was shot three times as a 22 year old, and not because I did anything wrong, but I, you know, I was being I was a victim of robbery. But a, a lot of these shootings come from misunderstandings, bravado, um, or miscommunication, right? And so there was a time in my life where I felt like I had to carry a gun. Whereas when I became a more effective communicator and could be able to de-escalate or diffuse situations, and I felt like my my ability to communicate was more powerful than having a gun on me. Um, so I didn't mind going out. I, I don't feel like I need to have a gun going out the South Side or in some some of the more uh, crime-ridden areas of Harrisburg uh, because I feel like you know the energy I bring and 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 the way that I communicate uh, is effective enough to disarm someone. <laughs> Thank you for that. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you joining us today and you've given us some really insightful things, some jewels and tools that we can take with us and share with you know our loved ones and our community. So thank you so much for your time. If there's any closing remarks, anything else you wanted to add or? Uh, I was just saying- Any you know, questions? Part of me, um, I mean, I I want to thank you guys for the work that you're doing for convening spaces like this. You know, as, as someone said on the, 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 the call earlier, right, they weren't familiar with who I was or certain resources. We, we kind of assume or make the assumption that, you know, this information is out there, people know. And sometimes it just takes different events or different, um, different avenues for them to be able to be introduced to that information. So uh, much like Asia said, for anyone who's on this call, um, you know, feel free to reach out to me. Um, again, um, especially when it comes to this kind of stuff, you know, consultations are free. You know, uh, I, I give those jewels and tools for free, you know, for the most part. So um, moving forward, I, I would say if you guys are going to convene similar events like this in the future, you know, feel free uh, to count me in. Thank you. We will keep that in mind for next year's conference. <laughs> Thank you for your time and thanks for joining us. Right, At this time, if any of you, bye. If any of you need a break, 
If not, we will proceed. No, any breaks? Everybody's good, all right. So next I wanna introduce Gregory Holt. He's one of our human relations representative here at PHRC and he'll introduce our next guest speaker. Gregory. Thank you, this is uh, Richard Hartwood, president and founder of the Hartwood Institute for Public Innovation has devoted his career to revitalizing the nation's hardest hit communities, transforming the world's largest organizations and reconnecting institutions to society. In 1988, after working on more than 20 political campaigns, attending Skidmore College and Princeton University, being named a Harry S. Truman Scholar and working for two highly respected nonprofits, Rich founded the Harwood Institute when he was 27 years old. Over the past 30 years, Rich has developed a philosophy and a practice of how communities can solve shared problems, create a culture of shared responsibility, and deepen civic faith. Today, Rich is spreading a vision for what it takes to create an America that reflects the best in us and the best of us. In his groundbreaking report, Civic Virus, Why Polarization is a, is a dig Misdiagnosis, Rich explains what's really going on in America and how we can get on a more practical and hopeful path forward. Please help me welcome Richard C. Hartwood. Well, thank you, uh, Gregory. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's great to be with everyone today. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Can. Great. Thanks. Um, it's really wonderful to be here. I I understand. I'm probably your last speaker today, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, so I hope you'll you'll stay with me um, for the next few minutes, and um, and then we can get into a conversation. I, look, I want to I want to spend a few minutes talking about. Um, healing and hope, and how we bring more healing and hope to our communities and to all people. It's no secret that we've all suffered for the last couple or few years, um, particularly during COVID. Um, more, almost a, a million Americans are dead because of this pandemic. Um, we have we are experiencing a long, long overdue reckoning with systemic racism. Our economy still does not work notwithstanding its growth, its recent growth still does not work for far too many um, folks in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and all across this country. Um, and then we're, we're watching over television um, this war in Ukraine and wondering how in God's name could something like this be happening in 2022. Um, I think for a lot of us, um, we're probably, for many of you, um, if you're like me, you might be coming into this space today feeling tired you might be coming into this space feeling worn down. You might be coming into this space feeling um, some sense of anger, maybe even rage about our inability to create change. You might feel as I do that change is happening too slowly um, in Pennsylvania and in this country. And some of you may even feel that it's time because you've been working so long and so hard at this, that it's time to give in and to give up. And what I would say today is that we need you and we need to focus on how do we bring more healing and hope to our communities right now to make uh, a better pathway, a more hopeful pathway towards positive educational outcomes for each and every individual in the Commonwealth. And how do we put an end to this school to prison pipeline that is plaguing um, too many individuals in too many communities? I come at what I'm going to talk about today with this belief that our role, our goal is for every individual in our society to be able to fulfill their potential, their individual potential, and for each and every individual to be part of America's promise moving forward. And I believe that this work needs to begin in our communities, which is what I want to talk about. Now, uh, we're told in this country at least, that we're too polarized to make progress on these issues, that these challenges are too difficult, that we're too polarized. And I've come to believe um, that this notion of polarization is both an explanation, has become an explanation and an excuse for inaction. An explanation and an excuse for inaction. As Gregory just mentioned, I, I just released a new report, our institute just released a new report that you can get off our website. Um, 
called Civic Virus, Why Polarization is a Misdiagnosis, where I spent six to nine months talking to Americans all across our country, people from rural Western Kansas, um, where there isn't even a street light in the town, to um, Southern Ohio, to South Central Ohio, to Houston and New Orleans, uh, to Spartanburg, South Carolina, one of the most conservative uh, counties uh, and communities in all of America. And if I were to send you the transcripts from these conversations and I removed the names of the communities and the references to the communities, you would be able to read these transcripts and not be able to tell who I was talking to, what community they came from, uh, what their demographics were, uh, over and over again, almost verbatim, you would hear the same comments from community to community about our country. And what people told me is that we are not polarized as Americans. They told me actually that something more profound is happening in the country, something more perilous, something more dangerous, but here's the good news, something more actionable than polarization. Here's what they told us, three quick things. One, they told me, and I wonder if you've experienced this in your own life, they've told me that we are increasingly separating and segregating ourselves from one another in our communities and in this country because of the level of anxiety that we feel, the level of pressure that we feel. And I just wanna emphasize this next point. And they said to me that this anxiety and this pressure that we're feeling started long before COVID. That yes, COVID has accelerated it. Yes, COVID has exacerbated it. Yes, COVID deepened it. But make no mistake, the sense of us separating and segregating from one another started long before COVID um, and it is plaguing our country. Two, point number two, they told us that our politicians, that our political leaders, that our news media and that our social media are intentionally manufacturing and stoking polarization for their own good. They are needlessly dividing us in order to gain votes, whether it's in Harrisburg or where I live in Washington, DC. They are needlessly dividing us and purposely dividing us so that they can gain viewers on cable television. They are dividing us on social media through algorithms that take us down into rabbit holes. Take us down into rabbit holes where eventually we are fighting one another and yelling at one another and pointing fingers at one another and demeaning one another, all so that they can drive up their numbers on social media for their own benefit and their own advertisers, all for their own good. And I ask you, who the heck gave them the right? Who gave them the mandate? Who the hell gave them the mandate to believe that they have the right to divide us for their own benefit at the expense of the common good and at the expense of the folks that you care so deeply about that you're serving each and every day. And number three, we Americans, the folks in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, whether you're in Western Pennsylvania in Erie or, or Pittsburgh, or whether you're in Central Pennsylvania, or whether you're in Eastern, wherever you are, the third point that people told us is that we are having a natural human response to this kind of surround sound noise that we've been engulfed by our politicians, news media, and social media. And that human response, that natural response, is that we are in a fight or flight mode. You know, when you're cornered, when you believe there is no alternative, what do you do? You either come out swinging because you want to win the fight because you are so fearful of what will be taken away from you, because you are so fearful about what will be done to you, because you are so fearful that you don't have a future, you come out swinging and fighting or you flee. And so many of us have retreated from public life altogether, believing that if we say the wrong thing, we will somehow get clobbered. We will somehow get demeaned. We will be told if we're, if we're, if we're a protector of gay rights that somehow we are grooming young people. 
which is nonsense. Over and over again, this is happening. The best analogy I can give you about what's going on in our country, and I don't know if this works for you, but it works for me, is that it's as if we are in a house of mirrors. We're in a house of mirrors. And you know, the worst feeling in the world is feeling trapped, feeling, you know this from the work that you do, from your own lived experience. The worst feeling in the world is feeling that there is no future, that you are trapped. There is no way to get out. And so we are in a house of mirrors where we know there is a doorway somewhere, but we can't seem to find it. We can't seem to find it. The divisions that we face in our country are less about ideological polarization, which the news media would have us believe, which our politicians would have us believe. It's less about that and more about social and psychological conditions and our fear of one another, our fear of one another. And the question I know that you're asking, and the reason why I was so happy to accept the invitation to come be with you this afternoon, is what kind of nation do we want to live in? What kind of people do we want to be? What kind of connection do we want to have to one another? Who is it that we seek to become in this country? And how is it that we're going to get on a better path to get there? Now, my message today is one of healing and hope, not one of all the things that are wrong in our country. And so I happen to believe that there is reason to have hope, real hope, practical hope. And it's and the example I'm going to use is right in your Commonwealth. It's Reading, Pennsylvania. Your vice chairwoman, Dr. Jens, who invited me to come speak today, who I have great admiration and respect for. She's a Reading native. She knows she lives in Reading and she's done work in education for years and years in Reading. And in Reading, in her hometown, in her hometown, we've been working with folks for almost a year now. Where folks from all across Reading came together to create a community led, community driven agenda for education to make a path towards positive educational outcomes for every young person and every family in Reading. And here's the thing they created this agenda. I didn't create this agenda, the folks in Reading created this agenda. They created this agenda at the very same time that this crazy debate over critical race theory was happening all across this country, holding hostage, holding hostage our agendas and our ability to move forward and make sure every young person has an opportunity in this country. They created this shared agenda at the very same time that communities are banning books in education. The very same time that they're banning books, they created this shared agenda. They created this shared agenda at the very same time that there have been school board upheavals from the left in San Francisco and the right in other communities where people are being thrown off school boards, this community came together and this school board is now supporting this shared agenda. It's happening. They did this when we're having arguments over masks, wearing masks in schools. Reading, Pennsylvania, that was once almost all white and now is 70% Latino that 10 years ago was named the poorest community in all of America, the folks in Reading, Pennsylvania came together and created a shared agenda around education. Now they're beginning to take action on it. Now, if you think Reading is an anomaly, is somehow the exception to the rule, I just wanna to mention to you that we were working with two other communities at the very same time who created their own community-led, community-driven agendas in other parts of the country, in Lexington, Kentucky, the Old South, and in Clarksville, Tennessee, which is one of the largest, has one of the largest army installations, Fort Campbell in all of the country. And here's what the folks in Reading came up with. I'm not gonna spend too much time on this, but I just wanna mention five quick agenda items in their shared agenda that I think matter to the work that you do to make sure that we have more positive educational outcomes in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and that every individual that you work with can actually have an opportunity to fulfill their God-given potential and be part of America's promise. One, folks in Reading said, we need to create more pathways for success for every young person, not just those who are planning to go to college, as important as that might be for some. 
we know most people will never go to college. And yet, why is it that people in schools and their families believe that if you don't go to college, you're not valued, that you don't have a place in our society, that you don't have a future, that you don't have a pathway forward. And so what folks in Reading said is let's make sure that there is a pathway for every single person in Reading moving forward, regardless of whether you're gonna to go to college or not. And if you're not, Let's make sure there are different options that meet you where you are, just as Mr. Flood was just talking about. Let's make sure there are options for you and pathways for you. And let's make sure that these are relevant to your life and to your aspirations. And let's make sure your families know about them. <laughs> and let's make sure that if English is not your first language, we're communicating you, with you in a language you do understand so that you have an opportunity to move forward, which leads me to my second point. English as a second language. I believe that this is fundamentally an equity issue. Folks in Reading told us, you know, there are lots of folks in Reading, as you know, who came to America not speaking English. There are adults who still don't speak English. There are kids who grew up in bilingual homes. There are young people who came here who need English as a second language. This is an equity issue. The folks in, in Reading told us, if you can't speak English, you can't navigate American society. You don't have opportunities. You don't have access to opportunities. We can't treat this as an add-on. This is core to who we are as America. This is core to you participating in America's promise. And so, it's inexcusable to have too few slots for English as, second English as a second language for folks in Reading. It's inexcusable for us to have inadequate programs that actually aren't effective and don't do the work we need to do. It's inexcusable that these programs are too fragmented and that people can't find their ways to them. It's inexcusable in America in 2022. We cannot have a multicultural diverse society, which I believe creates more energy and more ingenuity and more entrepreneurship in this country. If we wanna be this diverse country, which I believe this country, it makes this country great, then we need to make sure everyone can participate. English as a second language is a baseline. It's a, it's a baseline. Third, mental health. Mr. Flood was just talking about this. We need to spend, there is a crisis in America. A new report just came out. There's a crisis in America happening in mental health. It didn't happen because of COVID. It's been going on for years. It just got worse because of COVID. But here's the thing, we've got to reimagine how we think about mental health in our society. Yes, we need to ensure that our suicide rates go down. In Berks County, where Reading sits, suicides are up. We need to do something about that. At the same time, as you know, lots of folks in Reading are traumatized. They've experienced trauma because of poverty. They've, they've experienced trauma because of domestic violence. They've experienced trauma because of drug addiction and drug abuse. We need to ensure that we have trauma-informed approaches. We need to ensure that we're engaging folks who need long-term care and get them on their feet and move them forward. And we also need to ensure that we think of mental health in terms of people's loneliness, of so many young people who feel abandoned, of so many young people who don't have a loving adult in their life, of so many young people who don't have a role model in their life. We need to think of this as a spectrum. And here's the thing, we can't relegate this just to professionals. We need to mobilize our entire communities to do this work and to build support systems around every individual in our communities. And when I say every individual, I mean every individual, every individual. We can't wait. Fourth, the folks in Reading said, we need teachers who look like the community because young people need to see examples of people who are, are in positions of authority, who are leading a classroom, who can inspire them to become teachers themselves or other, or to, to pursue other aspirations that they hold in their lives. How is it that we have school systems made up of 
majority minority students made up of mostly white teachers. It doesn't make any sense. And so we need to deal with the pipeline of getting more folks who can teach folks who look like the community. And then lastly, early childhood. We know from all the research that getting folks off to a good start is really critical. It's really critical. Yet we have far too few uh, slots for young people and many people, particularly people in poverty, people who don't have access to public transportation systems, people who are working three jobs, don't have even access to the slots that exist. And lastly, many of the slots that exist are purely inadequate. They're, they're, not, up to, they're not up to standards. And so we need major investments in communities. But here's the thing, we've got to meet people where they are. We've got to meet people where they are and not assume we know what they want or what they need. And too often we do. Are you still with me here? Give me some sign. Yes, yep. we are. Yes, All we're right. here. Yep. So here's the thing. All good. Good, thanks, Dana. Here's the thing. That's part of the shared agenda for Reading. There are other agendas for <clears throat> Lexington and, and Clarksville, which I'm happy to share with you. But, but here's the point I really want to underscore today. How we do the work is as important as what we do. How we do the work is as important as what we do. And I just want to cover a few points here. Too many people in our communities, including Reading, but in, in communities, our work, my work has spread to all 50 states and 40, 40 countries, but all across the United States. Too many people believe they don't have a voice. Too many of us don't believe that what matters to us what matters to me matters to all of us. Too many people believe that even when our elected leaders or school systems or, or professionals listen, they don't actually hear us. They actually don't hear us. And even when they hear us, they don't act on what we're saying. And I could tell you all sorts of sophisticated ways to do civic engagement, but instead I just wanna talk about a basic, what I call the basic dig dignity equation. When people believe that their voices aren't heard and their voices don't matter, then they believe that their reality is not understood. And when we as human beings do not believe our reality is understood, then our dignity has been stripped from us. And when we believe that our dignity has been stripped from us, it's game over. It's game over. That's right, that's when violence appeals to us, Chris. It's when, when we lose our dignity, and here's the thing, and you know this, I know I'm singing to the choir here, but dignity is not negotiable. Dignity is a birthright. I don't need to tell the Human Relations Commission folks this, but we need to keep saying it over and over and over again in our work. Dignity is a birthright, it's non-negotiable. And as a basic tenet of doing this work, as a basic pathway to ensuring that everyone can have better educational outcomes, that everyone can fulfill their potential, that everyone can be part of America's promise. We need to get real about ensuring that every person's dignity is honored. That seems to me a baseline, a starting point. From there, I think we have to move away from all the negative talk in our society. When we do engage people, we engage them about their problems. And we know when we talk about our problems, we end up with a litany list of them. And, and when we end up with this litany list of them, we wanna know why they haven't been solved. And when we say we wanna know why they haven't, we want, haven't been solved, we wanna know who was responsible for solving them. And when we figure out who was responsible, then we wanna cast blame at them. And when we cast blame at them, then we demonize them. And before you know it, we are in a toxic cul-de-sac that takes us nowhere. It's like a circular firing line. where We're just firing away at each other and there's no place to go. And when we don't do that, 
we end up in these silly conversations about visioning. I don't know if you've been in these visioning exercises where we create these utopian visions about what we want. You know, those things, you know, you ever been in these things with little yellow dots and they say, just put your little yellow dot next to the things that you care most about. And we create these reports that have 1500 recommendations and 300 task forces, and they're printed in four color on glossy paper. And you ever notice what happens to them? Not a damn thing. They end up, they end up on shelves gathering dust or in, in our waste paper baskets when we're cleaning our office out. No one's interested in a utopian vision. A single mom with two young kids, she's not interested in a utopian vision. She wants to know how she can send her kids to public school tomorrow and where they can get a shot at America's promise, where they can get an opportunity to fulfill their potential, where someone's gonna give a damn about their future. She doesn't want a utopian vision. Here's what she wants. She has, we need to start engaging each other in conversations about our shared aspirations, not our problems, not utopian visions, but our shared aspirations. You can't tell me that someone who's on the school to prison pipeline, the pathway, doesn't have aspirations for their life. Their aspirations may have been dashed. Their aspirations may have been denigrated. Their aspirations may have been damned, but they have them. They may be caked over. They may have turned cynical, but deep within them, they have aspirations for their life. We all do, it's part of being a human being. It's part of being alive. We need to reconnect people with their aspirations for their lived lives. And we need to connect our aspirations to one another. Because here's the thing, when we hear each other's aspirations, when we hear our shared aspirations, we begin to understand that while there are real differences in society and they really do exist, there are some things that we do hold in common. And when we identify those things, we can actually get to work together. That's what they did in Reading with this shared agenda. They, it's not that they swept away their differences. They figured out their shared aspirations and what they do agree on and how we can get to work on them. When we begin to see our shared aspirations, we begin to see that no one leader, no one organization, no one individual can achieve them on their own. We need each other. We need each other. We can't go it alone on our own. That's no pathway to success. That's the pathway to losing. The pathway to success is that we got to reach out to each other and begin to work together in new ways, which leads me to my third point. Talking is not enough. If we could talk our way out of the challenges that we face today, we would have done it a long time ago. A long, long time ago. I don't know about you, but I'm tired of talk. I wanna see some action. I'm, I'm here today because I wanna see some change in Reading, Pennsylvania and in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. I'm tired of all this talk. So here's the deal. We do need to figure out our shared aspirations, but then we quickly have to start building together. We need to do things together because in doing together, we begin to see our shared humanity. We begin to see that each of us has talents and gifts that we have to offer. No matter what kind of car you drive, what kind of house or apartment you live in, how much money you got in your wallet, where you went to school, if you graduated from school, it doesn't matter. We all have gifts and talents to offer. We all have innate capabilities. They're God-given. We each have something to bring to the table. Let's start tapping into it. Let's start using it but we got to build together. When you hold a ladder for someone, you begin to see that you share something in common. When you put up a wall together, you start to see that you each have something to offer. When we read to a child together, we have something to offer. We need to start building together and stop talking so much. And when we build together, it will make our conversations go a hell of a lot more smoothly because we'll have greater confidence. We'll have greater momentum. We'll have a greater belief in ourselves and in one another that we can actually come together and get some stuff done, which leads me to my fourth point here. We've got in our communities lots of great services and programs. Those folks, they're doing great work. You, many of you might be doing this. My hat's off to you, really. Providing services and programs is enormously difficult today. 
But services and programs, while they're necessary, they're not sufficient. They're not sufficient. We need what I would call more catalytic organizations and communities that work across dividing lines, that work across boundaries, that bring people together, that make it their purpose to bring people together, not to coordinate everything, because coordination doesn't mean we're doing it any better, just means we're working in lockstep, and not to collaborate like we all write about in grant proposals and other things, when we know, we know damn well we're just talk, using a $5 word to get some money from some funder, but we're not going to collaborate. We may meet together, but we're not actually going to collaborate. We need organizations that can bring us together so that we actually have the hard conversations about what is our purpose in our communities to, in doing work together. How is it that we're going to have to combine and recombine our efforts in ways that we never dreamed of before? How is it that we can no longer take credit for deeds we did not do? We have to lift each other up and stop spending so much time trying to take credit? How is it that we're gonna integrate our work together? Integrate, not do it side by side, but integrate. So the young person in Reading, Pennsylvania doesn't have to navigate a system they can't make sense of because every service provider and program provider is worried about their own brand, their own funding, their own metrics, while this young person and their families can't figure out how to create a pathway forward. We've got to put people at the center of all our work, not ourselves and our own programs. It's got to end. If we want to change the school to prison pipeline and make sure everyone can get on a better pathway educationally, we got to change our own behaviors. We got to change our own behaviors. Lastly, we got to stop making false promises. Now, you know this better than I do. You know this better than I do. And yet, we each do it. We make promises we know we can't keep and we ought not to make, but we do it anyway. Why? Because we think we'll get better support. Maybe we'll get more funding. Maybe someone in Harrisburg will give us more money. We live in a country where people are frustrated, where they're in a fight or flight mode, where they're cynical about the promises we make. When we make promises we can't keep, we only deepen people's frustration and cynicism. It's a crime, it's a crime. I think we've got to come to terms and realize that hope actually does matter to people. That hope to that young mother, and I'm not, I've written four books on hope. I'd love for you to buy one of my books, but you don't need to buy one of my books. Here's the deal. The young mother I was talking about with two children, here's how I define hope. When she goes to bed at night, does she believe her kids are actually going to get a fair shot tomorrow in school? Does she believe that someone's actually going to care about her kids? When her two kids put their heads on a pillow like all of us did when we were younger, you know, right before you're about to fall asleep and you're thinking about tomorrow, do those young kids, do her two young kids, do they think that tomorrow can be better than today? Do they think they're going to have a better shot tomorrow than they did today? Do they think that there's going to be some opportunity for them tomorrow that they didn't have today? That's my definition of hope. It's that basic. And so when we're doing this work, like the work we're doing with partners in Reading, we cannot make false promises about creating better pathways for success for each young person. We can't make false promises about mental health. We can't make false promises about early childhood education. We've got to be real with folks about what we can achieve by when, and then we've got to deliver. In my faith, much like in most faiths, there's a teaching that says, if you save one life, you save the world. Now, obviously, if you save one life, you didn't save the world. But what you did do is you made a contribution. What you did do is you signaled that you care. What you did do is that you turned towards someone else. What you did do is you exerted yourself in a positive way for the common good. What we need to focus on is what is our contribution to hope? How can we make hope real for people? And how can we see our role as being agents of hope in each and everything that we do in our work? So let me just close with this. 
in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, when I'm talking about, I'm not talking about coming together and holding hands and singing Kumbaya. This is hard work. You all know that. You do it every day. But it's possible to make progress and it's possible to create hope. I happen to believe that this hope, this healing hope we need so desperately need in our communities, that it's in our country, it's got to start in local communities. Because in local communities, it's where we can turn outward toward one another. It's where we can see and hear one another. It's where we can begin to build together. It's where we can affirm each other's dignity again. And then we can begin to spread it. I'm not naive. Working in local communities is not enough. It needs to go bigger. We need to get it to Harrisburg. We need to get it to Washington, DC. We need policy change as well. But it's got to start someplace. And we've got to then find the brave leaders in other parts of our society who will latch onto this and move with us. Why do I believe this? I, I believe it not because I read it in a book or even wrote a book about it. I believe it because American history tells us that we started with a whole bunch of original sins, a whole bunch. And over and over again, notwithstanding the challenges that we have faced, we keep trying to move, not always successfully, but we keep trying to move towards a more perfect union. It's how the American Revolution came around. It's how we abolished slavery. It's how women's suffrage happened. It's how child welfare laws happened. It's how civil rights and voting rights happened. It's how gay rights happened. It's how seatbelt laws happened. It's how we're gonna put this country on a better path today. It's by those of us working in local communities who believe, who insist, who demand that there's gotta be a better pathway forward. So we don't need to surrender to the false notion of polarization. We can actually come together and rebuild our communities the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, and this country. Thanks so much for having me. I, I'd love to have a conversation about this, and I really appreciate it. I'm flattered to be here today. Thank you so much for joining us, for your time, for your insight, and those really important points that you touched on, especially dignity, to me personally, it being a birthright and going about the issues that we all face with a healing and that hope at the forefront. So I wanted to ask a question that was posed in the chat to you. It says, there's an agenda to fill Pennsylvania prisons. How can we who have the aspirations um, to reduce black youth entering the prison system combat that? Yeah, look, I, I think it's the type of things that people in writing are, are trying to talk about now, which is we keep looking for the magic answer. I don't, I don't mean folks here on this call, but I mean in society. We keep looking for the single program, the single policy prescription, the single initiative, the single, you know, what's called collective impact in, in a lot of the work that's being done in communities. And, and I think I think we have to recognize that there is no single answer, that we have to, like folks in writing are talking about, that there is a, a collection of things that we need to do, and that the reason why there's a collection of things is because we're dealing with human beings, we're dealing with our lived experiences, and we're dealing with communities and systems that are coming at us from all different directions. And, and so I think this is fundamentally about how we rebuild communities and create the right kinds of supports that give people a real opportunity and a real chance. And that's why I think things like in Reading, just to echo those things, but you know, that they're a real pathway, that we're starting in early childhood and making sure that people are getting off to, young people are getting off to a good start. You don't get off to a good start as, as you know, and as the person who asked this question knows, you don't get off to a good start, you're already behind the eight ball. You're already, you're already struggling. And then society tells you that it's your fault. That somehow you did something wrong. You didn't do anything wrong. You didn't have the right opportunity. And so I think we've got to focus on what does it mean to create these opportunities, whether it's early childhood or making sure that 
if you're um, uh, if you're in need of mental health support, and, and really, you know, Mr. Flood talked about this. You know, mental health support to me includes mentoring. We've got to make sure that you know every young person has a loving adult. Or you know, look, I, when I was born, I was diagnosed with cystic fibrosis. I was left for dead in 1960. That meant I was going to be dead by age five at the latest. And luckily my diagnosis changed, but my illness continued. And I was saved by three men who didn't know each other, who entered my life in different parts of my life and literally made sure I didn't fall through the cracks. And they were the ones who initially taught me that it was okay to have hope and not just despair. These are three men from different walks of life. Every young person, so I'm talking from experience here, not theory, every young person should have the same opportunity I did. To have young men or have men or women or someone in their life who can help guide them, support them and tell them they love them, right? And so mental health support, yes, let's reduce suicide, but let's get at this long before a suicide. Long before a suicide, that's too late, it's too late. So, um, so we've got to build these supports so that people have real opportunities and can actually move towards their aspirations in their lives and not simply try to fight their problems. Uh, so I hope that helps. Yes, thank you. Um, and Commissioner Dr. Raquel Yanks has a question. I, I didn't have a question because uh, I have been just in awe of Rich since I met him, and um, I understand uh, exactly what he's coming from and what he's saying. And uh, I just want to thank you so very, very much for taking up your busy schedule. I know you're a very, very busy man and coming to uh, present to us today. Uh, I hope that someday in the near future, I have an opportunity to meet you personally because we have so much in common and so much that we uh, are fighting for. I've been fighting all my life. I don't know if you were here this morning or heard my presentation on parental involvement, but to me, that's a missing link. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I did my doctoral dissertation on parental involvement, I realized more than ever how we have kept the most important features that a child ever has away from education. And you know, if we have to do this together, teachers cannot work in isolation and parents need desperately to find out how it is that they can help their children. Because there's not one single parent in this world that doesn't want what's best for their child. Right, right. yeah. Well, Commissioner, thank you. You know, I'm here today because of your invitation um, and because of my admiration for you. And so um, thank you. For your kind words and i and i do look forward to meeting together finally in person in reading so i i, I look forward to that day i don't see any questions in the chat but if anyone has any questions any raised hands i'm overlooking they'd like to address hey i did want to follow up with the question after his after the first question that was asked um, first, I want to appreciate your passion as well, because it's definitely coming through, right? Um, and what I'm hearing is um, a passion you have, right, for more humanity hmm. being put back into how we deal with a lot of these issues. Um, so what I want to push back on a little bit, though, is on... When we, when we know there is an agenda, it's like, how do we combat acknowledging the agenda, right? Because too often the agenda is ignored that uh, Pennsylvania particularly budgeted a lot of money into building prisons. Yeah. They had to know how they wanted to fill those prisons and who yeah. they would fill those prisons with, right? That's a, that's a real aspiration that went into a, lo a lot of effort was put into that. So the question I posed was more about 
when we look at trying to be humane, right? While we're trying to resolve the crisis of over and mass incarceration of black and brown people, how, we know we can't fight it out all the time, but that, that's where that urgency and rage comes from to say, well, hey, that's an aspiration that goes against everything we're gonna do in child development. It's gonna go against everything we do um, in preschool because they are planning, the aspiration is to get these preschoolers to that prison one day, some way, shape, some way, somehow. And, and I guess my question was more about where's that, where's that bridge to, to make them understand the urgency we have to not want to see more and more youth in prison, particularly black and brown bodies. But we do get, we can't keep fighting it out, but we are tired, we're exhausted with the, the rate at which black people are in prison. Yeah, thanks for following up. And um, I, I'm sorry, I didn't initially answer your, your question. The, um, I think you're right that, look, I think some of us, there are some folks who are going to continue to fight that and we need that fight right and so what i'm about to say i just want to say that you know we're in a pluralistic society and part of living in a pluralistic society is having debates about things now if you're trying to build public will which is in part what i take from your question which is how do we change the trajectory of what's happening yeah, then I think I think that's then I think the work in writing is instructive and, and other work that we've done and, and others is that we need to clearly reframe the discussion from one of, you know, as you were saying, locking, quote unquote, locking people up to how is it that we're gonna create a society that works, a community that works and where people can be self-sustaining and self-supporting, how does that work? And to do that, we're gonna to have to focus on some things we all need, know we need. And I think what becomes important here is, like I said in Reading, is how do we figure out what pieces we can start to peel off to get support for that does, as you, I think, as you use the word bridge, that builds a bridge between different constituencies that enables us to get moving. Because our, the biggest challenge I think we face right now is we're stuck. And stuck means we're losing, right? It means that the current, the current status quo is gonna continue. And that's, we've got to somehow get on a different trajectory. To do that, I think we've got to figure out where are there places where there's enough agreement that we can move and get things moving and then build over time. And I think that's, I think that's the challenge that we're facing. I think um, trying to reverse things all at once, we're, gonna, we're seeing that in police reform and other areas just does it you get you get you get a, a, a reaction that's just as as uh as hard so. and so to your point and then i'm gonna digress because i'm very passionate about this topic um um would you say if we use what you offered us as far as um coming together to discuss aspirations right aspirations of those of us who want to see less youth in prison aspiration of the politicians and people at large who create millions of dollars off of these prisons, right? Um, how would you say we can, would you say that telling the truth, because you said one of the things we gotta do is stop giving these false promises, right? Would you say that the first step could be um, an acknowledgement of these aspirations? Like, is that a safe place to start? Like, get the billionaires making money off prisons to acknowledge that's been their aspiration this whole time. Um, what I would say is, uh, that's a great question. What I would say is that you, 
you know, there's a state senator in Michigan who is acute because she supports gay rights was accused of grooming. And this is in the news now, right? And she came out and she said, this isn't grooming. Let me tell you what grooming is. I'm just supporting X. So in that case, I think what she did is really instructive because she didn't demonize her opponents. She mm -hmm. didn't denigrate them. She didn't stoop basically to their level. Mm -hmm. She just said, look, here's the deal. And then she pivoted to, this is what I'm for. And so I think we can say, here's the deal, but let's focus on what we're for because I think what you wanna create and what I wanna create, and I suspect everyone on this call wants to create, is change. And I think the way that we're gonna to get to change that is supported and where we can move things is A, it's gonna start in our local communities. B, it's gonna start by focusing on our shared aspirations. Cause I know I'm saying this from experience, not from belief mm -hmm. that when you ask people about their shared aspirations for their community, there is enough that people agree on. We're working in Alamance County, North Carolina right now. It's one of the most <laughs> crazy places in the world but I'm sure there are enough shared aspirations for us to get some stuff moving. And that, um, so I think that's, I would say you have to pivot to shared aspirations, at, not utopian visions, but shared aspirations about things we do agree on and how we can create them and get in motion. Thank you for that. And again, I appreciate your, your passion. Well, thank you. Thanks for the question. How you how you approach this model. Great. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Other questions? Yeah. Or, I'm from New York. I love disagreements. Any disagreements? <laughs> how can you disagree with something so basic <laughs> and so important and so truthful? What happened is, you know, we put our hand in the sand and, uh, you know, we are, that's not my problem. That's not my problem. What's happened across the street, that's not my problem. But it is our problem. It is our problem and we need to deal with it. You know, uh, I said this morning about children coming to school in first grade and the first thing they're handed is a reading book. And these children don't even have the vocabulary to right. begin to read. Because at home, the vocabulary is limited, or because they are non English speakers, or because whatever reason. Uh, so they come to school and they're already, they are behind the eight ball, you know. And so instead of changing the curriculum and started meeting those children where they are, we try to put a square peg in a round hole. Right, right. Those children are traumatized, and those children either become. Uh, real troublemakers, and then they're tested because they are mentally uh, sick. Listen, Rick, I have seen it all in 40 years in education, actually in the trenches. I have seen it all. Yeah, well, you know, it's interesting when you talk about people's head in the sands, I think, you know, look, we all know, right, there's some folks, back to Ms. Hightower's comment, there's some folks who who aren't interested in change, they're not interested in changing. And I think sometimes we can spend a lot of our time trying to get them to change as opposed to figuring out who's ready to go and how do we figure out our shared aspirations and who's ready to get moving on them and, and, and how do we get moving and how do we think about change as trying to create a trajectory of hope that has increasing momentum, which you know nowadays is really difficult. I, I make I know that. Um, we're working in Jackson, Mississippi, right now. It, it's very hard work um, for the folks there. So, um, but but we've got to we've got to find the folks who are ready to start to move and 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 start moving forward with them. So, any other qu questions? Oops. Thank you. other questions in the chat and I just want to thank you so much for your time and for we have your resources up on the screen so if anybody wants to grab your books thank you so much for sharing that as well and this concludes our 
conference. I want to thank everyone for hanging around. I know it was about a good three hours, no bathroom breaks, but you guys, I thank you for your participation as well. And please join us tomorrow, same time, 12 o'clock, where we'll have a new panel of guest speakers joining us for day two of this very important topic. All right, have a great afternoon.